All right, y'all. Let's get into this thing. I'm excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so these guys, I don't, I don't know who all um, knows who. Uh, I know that Shane has played here a handful of times with us and it's blessed us by being here and just being awesome. Um, but it, just to kind of introduce these guys, so this is Michael, Michael Pope. Um, Hello. Ooh, more volume. I'll, I'll, I'll get the obvious one out of the way. Um, Michael was uh, <laughs> one of the lead guitar players for Bethel Music um, in, you know, the first however many records. How many records were you on, man? I don't know the number at this point. It's like but 40? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not 40. Um, the first record I played on there was For the Sake of the World. Heck yeah. So that was like 2011? Yeah. Something like that. And then Victory was the last one that I played on. Dude, so quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. A, a um, handful of them here and there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Michael was obviously a, a big part of that um, movement, not only just uh, from a songwriting perspective and, and guitar parts and all those kinds of things, but also I think for guitar players and worship music, um, obviously, like, you made a, a really big impact. And um, so it's super, super great to be able to have him here. I mean... You just got off tour with Taya. Um, yeah. Dude, like... First tour in five years, man. Dude, felt good, wild. surprisingly. We'll need bunk stories later. Oh, you got it, dude. <laughs> you got it. Um, so, yeah, this is Michael. He's currently living in Nashville. He's uh, married, has an almost two-year-old daughter. <laughs> yeah. Who we've definitely had a lot of fun conversation around oh, yeah. that. Toddlers are the best. Guitar's all right, but the best gig in the world is dad. Come Always on, and forever. Man. Like, Come on now. Austin knows, Shane knows, <laughs> like, dad life is the best life. Heck yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then this is Shane. So, uh, obviously, if you've been able to meet Shane, uh, you're a very lucky individual because he's the bomb and he's the best. Um, wife, two kids. Shane's done tons of work also with Bethel, Jesus Culture, Kim Walker, um, a bunch of people in the worship world, but also outside of it. Um, currently working on a record with an indie artist, Iowa Blue, so be looking out for that. Um, we just finished a record together, to actually doing one in Antioch, California, Fellowship, which was super, That's super we great. we met for the first time. Heck yeah, dude. We bonded. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it was... Uh, BFL, dude. Bros for life. Let's go, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens when you put us in an Airbnb for like three days. Yes. Um, no, yeah, but it was it was such a fun time, and then even getting to just watch... Uh, not to brag on you, but like just getting to watch Shane and our buddy Ryan, who's also played here a few times, Ryan Huntington. I don't know if you guys have been able to meet him, but um, they produced the whole record, and it was such an amazing experience just from um, not just parts and like how to, you know, like play what had been written, but also just musicianship and really, um, you know, kind of how do, how do we work together as a team and as a group to be able to make something great. Um, and they're just the best communicators and so great at it. So um, let's thank both of these guys for being here. Let's give it up for them. Come on. All right. Um, so kind of how this is going to go, uh, I have some questions, some, like, premeditated. Are you on? Are you working? I think so. Praise yeah. God. Um, some, some questions that we kind of formulated that we were, um, you know, obviously within our ministry, kind of what we're trying to achieve and... Um, you know, ultimately how we can kind of grow and get better in these areas, especially guitar and um, as a band. But uh, so we're going to we're going to go through some of those. And then these guys are probably going to play a little bit um, and we'll do some Q&A. So if you guys have questions and stuff, we can do that, too. Um, what's up, Dad? Good to see you, Daddy. Um, OK, cool. So the first question I'll start with, we'll start with kind of like playing, playing in a band, playing with a band, playing with other people. Obviously, it's very different than playing at <coughs> home and practicing your parts uh, individually. So the first question is, um, how, is Im how important is it as a guitar player to listen to the other members of the band um, while you guys are engaging with music? You go first. All right, I'll go first. Um, man, hearing the rest of the band is massively important, you know? Um, whether you're writing or, you know, playing pre-rehearsed parts on stage, uh, we all know there's a big difference between what we hear on a recording in our cars at home and what we hear on stage, what we play on stage. The sound of this room is a, is a different sound. So all these variables mean um, 
I constantly have to make micro adjustments to how I'm playing. Sometimes it can be hard to explain, so so bear with me sometimes because Shane and I were just talking about this. Like a lot of it can be subconscious, um, but just as a musician in general, I think it goes for any instrument, uh, not just guitar. You, you, you have to listen to the other musicians and know what they're doing because that's going to inform what you play. You know, the, the context in which you're seated in musically um, is, is going to dictate what you're able to play, what's going to work sonically. You know, if we show up Sunday morning and, oh, the track rig has gone down, all right, well, I'm going to probably have to make up for some of that in some way. I can't just play, like, two notes with way too much reverb on it, right? I might have to work some rhythm playing into it. Um, and so if I can't hear that the tracks are down and make up for that space, it might sound really weird. And, you know, I'm oblivious in my ears, right? So for me, that's, that's important. And especially, like, um, you know, on a session or something, like, that's the only way anything gets done. It's, it's a room full of people um, listening to each other and, and feeding off each other and each other's musical ideas. And you go, oh, man, like, what you played was so amazing. Like, I'm going to play something that complements that. So... I mean, man, hearing the other guys on stage, whether you're here in a studio, anywhere, I think that's like one of the most important things ever. Yeah. Shane, you got anything? Um, I mean, I think that pretty well covers it. But yeah, it is super important. I mean, anything can change, you know what I mean? And usually if I'm playing with another guitar player, <laughs> I will stare at them the whole time while we're playing because I'm always <laughs> trying to watch to see what they're doing or, you know, you. I think worship music is probably sp special in that you have, you know, usually designated parts. But oftentimes you might be playing with somebody and maybe they didn't learn the parts or something and you look over and they're in the register that you're in and I am always checking to see that because if someone's playing low and I'm playing low, then I'll switch and do something else. But yeah, it's super important. I mean, like Michael said, if you're in a session, you have to be listening to everybody else because that's how you make music, you know. So if you're not listening to everyone else and kind of changing depending on what they're doing, then it's almost like you're doing the karaoke version of <laughs> what you should be doing in the song. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, what would you say are like some techniques that you guys use to help keep you listening to the band? I know you said like looking at the other guitar players, one for you. What, what would you say are some things that kind of keep you on track that don't tunnel vision into your, just your part? Oh man, um, well, like Shane said, just just watching and like even making eye contact with people. Eye contact, especially with like a drummer, yeah. is a huge thing for me. Or just watching their hands for time. Um, in ear mix is a massive one, a big one. for me. Uh, I know, I know in my own ears, I actually mix my instrument quieter, which is apparently strange because um, like the tour I was just on, one of the fun things we would do is um, we would, you know, we were all sharing a, an in-ear console, right? So we could plug into our packs while another band was playing. And like I could hear the other guitar players intermix. Um, and one of the bands in particular, we were, we were talking about like, this is so strange. Like, how is he playing? Because the guy's mix was just like all his guitar and click and that was it. I'm like, Man, like, and I guess you're just playing the same thing every night. So, in, in, you know, in some ways that can, that can work. But I'm just like, man, if I can't hear what's going on, like, I, I, I feel lost. Um, and if my instrument is too loud, too, I tend to play very reserved. So, getting my inner mix dialed to where I can really hear the drums and feel the bass and hear what the other guitar player's doing and, and fill out the rest of the space with the tracks and the synth. I want to know what the keys are doing. Like, all that stuff is really important um, to hear. And so intermix is a, a big one for me. And I think it's just, I don't know, staying mindful of it. Like, it can be easy to get lost in, oh, man, like, I'm playing through these IR pedals for the first time and things sound weird and it's easy to get caught up in like a gear thing or like oh man my guitar keeps going out of tune or or man Shane should have worn his other shoes today or whatever it might be <laughs> uh and then you realize oh man I'm not really like paying attention to what I'm doing I'm just kind of like autopiloting or you know rambling in my own brain maybe I'm the only one that does that um but yeah being just intentional about that and and really prioritizing um 
listening. I think just listening in general is, a, you hear it talked about a lot with, with musicians, but uh, it, it's a little more rare to see it like really enacted, um, particularly in, in live performance at church, I find. Um, and so, yeah, just being intentional and really paying attention, you know, and it, and it starts at home when you're listening to the recordings, right? Like worship leaders send out a set list and they give us songs. Hey, I want to do this song by so-and-so because there's an emotion and a feeling and a vibe on that song that they feel is going to impact people, right? And it's our jobs to recreate that. So if I'm not listening and paying attention to that, like, you know, how can I expect to deliver that on stage to a group of people? So, yeah, that's... I guess that's kind of it for me, just being that's really awesome. intentional. I think that also pretty well covers it. I think the in your mix <laughs> is a, <laughs> that was what I was thinking of, that's a big one. I try to get mine as close to what like a front of house mix would be. That way you can easily tell what needs to be filled out because in worship music, it's such a dense style of music that you know, to fit to like rock and guitars in there, there's a pretty small, area that you have to fit into and it either works or it totally doesn't. I don't feel like you have as broad of a spectrum as you would in like <clears throat> rock and roll or, yeah. you know, whatever other kind of music you're playing. Um, so yeah, having yourself not too loud, that's a big one. Um, and I feel to... like guitars, were, and tell me how you feel about this, Shane, because I'm always curious to hear like other guys' opinions. I feel like electric guitar is a bit of an like an odd instrument sometimes because it's really easy to overtake a lot of things in a mix or it's either that or the complete opposite where it just completely hides. It's like, yeah. I can't hear my guitar. I just hear the cymbals no matter, you know, how, how loud I crank my guitar or it's like, oh man, like my, my guitar keeps overtaking the vocal or, or you know, <laughs> the piano or, or something, right? Like it, it's, yeah. it can be a difficult thing to to fit in sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely, I think that's totally true. Yeah, having some knowledge of how a mix works and how you fit into that, and then having your in-ear mix dialed and just, you know, always paying attention to what everyone else is doing would be really, really helpful. A one side question I would ask, like, off of that is, um, let's say you are, like, from a volunteer perspective that's serving in a church, how much, how much time do you feel like should be invested into that, into learning, you know, whether that be um, dialing in your mix, you know, talking with your sound engineer, like how, how much do you feel like somebody should dive into that to really kind of accomplish what you're talking about? I, I guess it depends on the church and, you know, whoever's in charge and kind of what the threshold of requirement is when you join the team, you know what I mean? And I'm sure everyone has like a base standard. Um, you know, and then however much else you want to put into it on top of that, it's up yeah. to you. That's, cool. That's always an interesting topic, right? Because you case hear about case. churches that pay their musicians, and so obviously it's like if you're being reimbursed financially for something, there's a little more responsibility there versus if you're volunteering. But, you know, uh, volunteer is kind of the nice word. Um, we're still serving on a worship team, right? Yeah. Like that's, we're, we're, we're here to play and have fun, that's, if that's not happening, we were talking earlier, like, if this isn't fun, don't do it. Take a break. Like, you should be having fun. That's, that's the point. <laughs> um, but man, like, it, it, it can just be, um, oh man, I, I, I don't know how to, how to phrase it. It's, it's just, yeah. we're, we're here to serve and we're here to do a job and there's a responsibility that we have as musicians. Like even going back and reading through like the Old Testament requirements about what it required to be a musician in the house of the Lord. It was like a heavy, weighty thing. And um, you know, pretty much on the level, if you like you, you mess up, you're done. Like there's not a do over, there's not a, hey, this is a safe place for you to, you know, try to flow prophetically, musically and all that. It was like, you gotta be on or you're done, you know? Um, and so there's, I know for me, there's a part of that I, I feel, again, I, I do this for a living, so it's a little bit different. But I think, I think if you're serving on a worship team, kind of like Shane said, you kind of have to do that personal evaluation between like your own time management, what your capacity is, is able to, to handle, um, and then what the church's 
expecting and hopefully you can find some middle ground there but it it it, it certainly is two parties working together to find that middle ground right like there's responsibility on both ends yeah. I think if it's me, I treat pretty much everything the same. You know, no matter where I'm playing or what I'm doing, I'll just treat it like a session and just be the same no matter where I'm at. Yeah. If I'm getting paid or not, you know. Yeah. yeah. But that's because you're just a me. real professional. Oh, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's super, super great. But not everyone, you know, is able to devote that. But yeah. I think if you can, you should. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, so if you if you walk in on a band playing live and you're listening to guitars, um, what makes a great guitar player in your mind? Like what what makes you walk out remembering that player? Hmm. Or I guess in general, just what do you feel like makes a great guitar player in a in a band? Oh man, it can be so many different things. I think the first thing I noticed is uh, like reservation. You know, if someone has the ability to do a bunch of cool, exciting stuff and they don't, that to me usually is yeah. the first sign of like someone who's really, really a master or a professional guitar player. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I always think about it, it's like a, a really good chef is never gonna use too much salt, you know? Mm. A really good guitar player, they're never gonna try to impress you, they're just gonna try to serve the song. And sometimes that means playing less notes or playing one note or not playing at all, you know what I mean? I think when you see a guitar player who really knows how to do that, because like Pope said, it is an awkward instrument. I mean, you're just right in the middle of everything. It's very easy to be super right or super wrong. Um, so <laughs> having a guitar player who really knows how to fit in and when to play and when to jump out and when to sit back, that's usually that. And I think yeah. another like quick telltale is vibrato, I think is a pretty, it's kind of like your own personal signature, you know what I mean? And it, it's a good stamp of where, where you're at in your process. Yeah. That's, a, that's one of the first things I notice. Yeah, those are all better answers than what I have to say. Um, <laughs> but just trying to think of something else. Um, a, a big one for me as of late, and I feel like it's probably because I'm going through this personally, where right now my ears are hypersensitive to it, tuning is a big one. Um, and especially because uh, if you've played guitar long enough, you know that this thing is never perfectly in tune, right? We've all seen photos on Instagram of those crazy, like, weird sideways frets or, you know, it, it doesn't look normal, right? It looks, looks scary and all in an, in an attempt to, to have this thing actually be in tune, right? But uh, I think, you know, a good guitar player, when I see a good guitar player live, I'm always like, man, how does he make that sound so in tune? like perfectly seated, you know, not just sonically and like with, with the tone, but like with tuning, that's, that's a big one for me. So I'd, I would add that tuning is a, and not just like, oh, did the guy like check his pedal tuner <laughs> 10 times in the song like I would do, you know? That's like a, a nervous tick for me, but it, it's like, oh, like I can tell his string, you know, his, his G string is a little flat, but I can, see and hear him bending it sharp just a little bit to play in tune, right? That's the, that's the Gibson thing. You have to tune the G string a little bit flat so that the fifth interval will be in tune, but then the third is always a little flat. So you have to kind of muscle memory train your, your, your finger to, to either push harder or, or bend that just a little bit sharp a lot of times. So it's like little things like that, that when you notice someone's doing it, it's like, oh, this guy gets it. Yeah, play something else. Play a different instrument. <laughs> That's a pain in the butt. <laughs> There's too many variables, but that's true. Like, I mean, you watch a video of like Stevie Ray, yeah. and he'll play, you know, for 13 minutes straight and just beat the crap out of his guitar, and it's a 62 Strat with 13s on it, and then by the end of the song, it's still in tune. It's like, that's him. It's not the guitar. Anyone that bends in tune perfectly every time, like John Mayer, when he does you know a, a, just a whole step bend Dude, or something and it is just instantly in tune every time i'm i'm impressed yeah it's pretty that's impressive. that's surprisingly hard to do when you're running around on stage with a band yes. in front of you know thousands of people <laughs> For me if you're standing still <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> i could be seated and like oh man Sitting. i sent that yeah. one sharp <laughs> 
so when you're when you're talking about like when you're listening to a band, you're listening to what everybody else is doing, and you were saying, you know, moments when you're not, when you feel like, hey, I, I don't even need to be a part of this conversation, or, you know, maybe I need to play out a little bit more. Like, yeah. what are some indicators that you guys feel like you listen for, or that, you know, something happens and you're just like, yeah, I need to stay out, or I need to give it a little more? I don't know. I usually get sick of hearing myself pretty quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> if there's an opportunity that I could drop out of, I usually assume, like, it's probably better if I don't. You know what I mean? If I'm tired of hearing me, I'll just stop playing. Just like waiting for that first chorus to come around, because no guitar player ever plays in the first chorus of yep. a worship song. Yep, or the reprise. It's yes. over. Um, that's usually when I stop. I usually have a pretty quick... I think because yeah. I am listening to everyone else, you know, I kind of listen to myself. Uh, is it subjectively or objectively? I had a cold. I'm not thinking straight. Kyle says subjectively. So I'm that's a that's a I difficult know. question to answer because yeah. that is entirely based upon what song are we playing, what section of the song are we in, what are the other band members playing. You know, if if we're in a spontaneous moment, right, and we're all just coming up with stuff on the spot, if the other guitar player and the keys guy is doing something pretty busy, I'm either going to be out or I'm just going to play something dead simple. You know. Give me that big old diamond, you know, rake on the one or volume swell city or something, right? So, you know, equally, if they're not playing much, well, then maybe I'll step out and be more melodic, right? Um, also kind of depending what the vocalist is doing because that's a, that's a big one for guitar. You hear guitar players talk about it all the time, but it's because it's the most important thing. Like, the, in talking about, like, what your guitar will overtake in a mix, it's always going to be the vocal first and that's the one thing you do not want to override or clash with so yeah yeah definitely awesome. i was gonna say something and I go for it dude. oh yeah i think you're right it's totally situational because you might be by yourself or you might be with people and there's an opportunity for you to, you to stop or if you're alone like i'm sure you've been in sets like this where in worship you're like the only person on stage who can take it anywhere and so you just don't stop playing <laughs> you just keep going you know what i mean I long, remember long Chris nights. Greeley taught me that one time I was on stage. It was a Sunday night at Bethel, and I was so sad because the band wasn't good, and I was <laughs> being a bummer. And <laughs> he came over to the talk back, and he was like, hey, you're the only person who can hear me right now. You have to drive this set. Like, you have to be the one to take it somewhere. And I was like, oh, okay, I actually have that responsibility. And you have that ability as a musician on stage to be the person who's like, no, I'm not going to let us just sit here, you know, if you do spontaneous worship and kind of flounder. Like, you can be the one to take it somewhere. Or you can be the one to go, hey, this song's, we've been playing this song for 25 minutes. Like, I'm going to drop out and let this thing <laughs> end, <laughs> you know? Land the plane. This Body language is a good to one, too. Body language. Body language, you know? Sometimes you look over and you give that nod, like, I got nothing, so Shane, please play something so I don't have to. Yeah. And then he looks back and does this. And then I go, no. And then, you know, the Lord doesn't show up and worship fail. But, you know. It happens. Just like you watch a worship leader for their, their leg to kick out the certain way, that means, right. oh, we got to play really hard now. You know, if you, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully you're paying attention to your other musicians as well and kind of learning to read their body language. And so sometimes you, you can kind of, you can kind of just tell, oh, like, so-and-so just did this on keys. They're probably going to do this because that's what they normally do. Or, oh, I hear Shane swelling in. Here comes a guitar part. I better listen to it and support it. Totally. You know? So just kind of look like hearing it but also seeing it is, is another form of, of doing that. Yeah, I think yeah. if your goal is always to make everybody else sound better, which it should be, yeah. then you'll, you'll be able to figure out whether you should play or not. Trust your intuition, too, because I know I remember being younger and sitting in sessions like this and being like, well, it's easy for this guy to say because he's played on X amount of records or, you know, he's the guy talking in a session or something. But, like, the only way to do anything on an instrument is just to go do it, you know? Like, we spent years sucking before anybody told us, hey, that sounds good. Or, like, it took a long time to, to learn these 
lessons in it. We only learn them just by trying it and doing it. So trust what your heart and your head are telling you in those moments. Um, Cause you'll, you might find more often than not, like your intuition um, is sometimes more right than it is wrong when yeah. you least expect it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, shifting it kind of a little bit of a new gear. Like when you, when you would get songs or you get new songs or something that you're supposed to play and learn, um, what are some like, one, what does that process look like for you? Um, and then two, like what are some either tips, things that you've just learned over time that help your, your mind either compartmentalize things or help you kind of learn what you're supposed to learn? The process usually looks like texting, hey, worship leader, can you send me some songs? <laughs> and like 24 hours later, no. No reply. <laughs> hey, worship leader, I could really use some songs. Another 24 hours. All right, like, I, I hope he doesn't want to do, like, a new song. Like, hey, um, just want to make sure, like, standard, standard, standard stuff, can you, like, you know, hit me with a set list? And then, you know, 24 hours before we're about to play, it's like, oh, here's 30 songs to learn. <laughs> um, they were busy shopping. Yes. <laughs> yeah, or decorating their home. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Worship leaders love to decorate. <laughs> <laughs> it's All true, right. man. Test, test me on this. But, um, That's good. Sorry, I got so sidetracked. <laughs> no, I've been awake for a very good. long time. I was like, man, I've seen some worship leaders decorate, man. That goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Old PTSD coming back there. Um, song learning for me, um, every time I talk about this, I, I feel fortunate. I started playing guitar when I was three years old. And so learning music, learning songs for me was pre-YouTube, pre like all this crazy info on guitar on the internet, right? So if I wanted to learn a song, uh, I had to skip to the right spot on a CD. And there wasn't like a speed up, slow down option. Like I didn't have one of those cool CD task cam machines that could like speed up and slow down for learning. Um, and at the time, like, I remember that being really hard, but um, looking back on it, I'm like, man, like, there's so much uh, I, I'm able to do now uh, in terms of, like, quickly learning a song and retaining that information, and I, I can, can attribute it to that. Like, nowadays, there's so much, there's so many tutorials for any song on YouTube, and 95% of them are wrong anyways, right? Um, but it's, it's so easy to find the quote unquote information, whether it's right or wrong, that I think it's easy for, uh, especially younger players nowadays, I see it all the time where it's like, yeah, oh yeah, I, I totally learned the song. And then it's like, you, you did not <laughs> listen. You looked up some guy's tutorial and like, <laughs> he maybe learned the song, you know, or heard it once or twice or something, right? Um, so for me, I think ear, doing it, learning as much by ear as you can is a, is a massive deal. If you need to start with YouTube or a tutorial or tabs or, or whatever as like a starting place, like that's cool, but I can't emphasize it enough. Like learn as much as you can by ear and just start with the basics. Like get a, get a notepad, don't type it on your phone or your computer, get a notepad with a pen, listen to the song and just start, all right, intro, cool. Verse one, pre-chorus, chorus one, just write down the arrangement through the whole song okay, I've got the arrangement, like, I know the order of things. Next, all right, well, let's, let's find the key, you know? Fish around on guitar until you find the key. Um, fish around until you find the chord progressions. Write the chord progression, you know? Uh, hopefully you guys know the Nashville number system. Um, if you don't, um, Jeffrey Cundy of, of Jesus Culture fame has a great uh, book on it. It might be an online course now, I don't know. Um, but it's really easy to, to learn that, like just learn to make a simple chart. And if you do that by ear, cutting out. If you, if you learn to do that by ear, um, it'll be frustrating and, and take a long time in the beginning. Um, but once you get the hang of it, man, it goes so fast and so fast. And it makes you such a better musician uh, when you do that. So yeah, if you're, if you're learning a song, um, if somebody sends you a song, uh, try to find the time to learn it by ear, you know, if you're not already. Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. That's how I learned to play was just playing along to CDs, you know. 
I mean, I started when I was really little, so I don't even know. I don't even know if we had internet. <laughs> we had one of those like CD players with the multiple. Oh yeah. You could put like nine CDs Five in it. Disc you know? changer, dude. disc changer, dude. Yeah, we had that, and that's what I would learn too, or whatever my dad had in on in the car. It was like the radio, the Eagle, always. Um, yeah, I think that's the best way to learn. So, like, if I'm, I guess it depends on the style too. So if if it is like worship music where there's really designated parts. I won't even like sit down and try to learn it until I know the song mentally, um, until I've gotten a chance to listen to it like probably at least five times. I don't know if you guys have this too, but I have like a guitar in my head, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and if I hear someone play something, I can picture the fretboard and I'm like, oh, I know what they're playing, you know? You can get to the point where you know a song without actually having to pick up the guitar. And then you just pick it up and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, there it is. Um, so that's usually how I learn stuff. I just listen to it over and over. If you want to be able to do that, a really easy way to teach yourself um, is just to sing a stupid, simple melody, like da 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 da, right? And then pick it out on guitar, right? <laughs> and that's just a really dumb example. But do that kind of thing enough, and man, that spills over into so much more, right? Like, you're like, oh, like, I heard that little riff on that Morgan Wallen song on the radio today, and I, I think I could just go home and play that real fast. That would be cool. And so you hear the song on the radio, and you go home and you play it, and you're like, oh, this is awesome. Like, I can hear something and play it. Like, first try, second try, right? So, yeah, the ear stuff is, is a big one. It's, it's everything. And yeah. um, that's, that right there is kind of how I learned to do that. That works, yeah. That's how I learn songs. And then if it's worship, I'll, I'll go listen to the parts and the stems. Watch the video tutorial. If, I, will I will do that will sometimes, say, too. <laughs> yeah, if, so, like, we were talking, because um, we got, we're going to play on Sunday here, which is going to be fun. Um, but the, so the first song is a Bethel music song, and we're like, oh, well, this is great. There's going to be two guitar parts that are pretty clearly defined. The mix on this particular song is a little, you know, washy, reverb, uh -oh. reverb land. You can say it, dog. Just say it. Row. Um, <laughs> but, but it's like you can get on YouTube and we can watch David Hislop and Jonathan Lee like showing us what they played. That that is a case where I would totally trust the video tutorial because, well, you know, straight from the horse's mouth, there's the guy that played or wrote it or, you know, that's the guy on the album. So I'll totally watch his tutorial. It's it's usually the the other guys, the you know. Worship.com, guitar licks, worship tutorials, worship or wh wh whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, usually, it's usually those it's kinds of things wrong. that are just like, well, this is what I would play if I played on this song. And so you got to watch out for those. <laughs> but anytime there's, you know, like an official tutorial, that stuff is great to watch. Um, but if you can do it by ear first, do it that way. Yeah, it'll be like some guy with a jazz master and like, three Jaguar pickups in it or something weird and <laughs> the it. parts are way more difficult than they're supposed to be and way too much reverb. Yeah. Did I ever tell you, Austin, <laughs> the story of when um, a worship tutorials guy roasted me on the on the internet? No, but I really want to hear it. Do you want to hear it real quick? We were working on the Tides record and Jen has a song that we unfortunately never ever played live, which is a bummer because I, I loved it. Um, but it's a song called Chasing You. You guys heard that song? Um, so we were working on it in the studio and Jen walked in wearing a Van Halen t-shirt and I took that as a cue to just instantly make a goof. So we're like, ah, like what should we do for this, for this bridge? And so I'm joking around and just, really bad finger tapping as a joke, right? And so I'm laughing, the producer's laughing, the musicians are laughing, and Jen goes, hey, that's cool, you should play that. And I instantly pooped. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 like, hey, that was a, that was a joke. Like, I'm not trying to put that on a, on a recording. She's like, no, like, I, I like that, you should put it on there. So that was the bridge part. <laughs> Record comes out, like, six months, seven months later or something, whatever. Uh, <laughs> someone was like, oh, somebody put out a tutorial for chasing you. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like, uh, 
you know, I know the mix of that song. I, I, I wonder how close they got. And so they get through the song, and I'm like, all right, this is, this is all right, you know, this is fine. It's not quite there, but, you know, all the, all the main elements are there. Uh, and then he gets to the bridge, and he goes, so this is the, the bridge part that's on the recording, and it cuts to a soloed, uh, like, multi-track of me doing all that stuff, right? And he just goes, yeah, you know, I don't think that's a very good guitar part for worship music. Whoever wrote that, like, they... They should probably learn how to write a worship music. Record. And I probably should have, because that's like the first record where it was like, hey, like you're the guitar guy, so you got to come up with this stuff because there's no one else around it's like with a guitar. It's not even your decision. But you're so I was just like, man, this guy roasted me so hard. And that was the last time I ever put a finger tapping part on a church song. <laughs> that's my story. I love story. that, dude. I love that. Um, Sunday. Sunday, dude. I'll do. You, I'll you finger do tap it. Sunday. There's okay. You guys know the cool way to tap. While we're on this yeah. subject, my favorite. I was born in Houston, Texas. My favorite guitar player is Billy Gibbons. Most days. Other days it might be Keith Richards. Billy F. Gibbons. Billy F. The Rev. F. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We won't say what that stands for. Um, no, but it shows up on his call ID. Bi people. People always think Van Halen or '80s, right? Um, Billy Gibbons. Phone. What? I said the F shows up on his caller ID. Oh, does it really? Yeah, it really wow, does. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty sick, actually. You probably still Billy, have a home Billy phone. Billy F. Gibbons, for those that don't know, invented <laughs> the finger tap, and it went something like this. He did that, and then look where Van Halen took it. And then that video of John Mayer doing that video came out, and like it was Instagram and TikTok of everyone doing that move. And I'm like, dude, that's Billy F. Gibbons. There Billy you go. There's, there's your there's your finger tap history lesson. Oh, <laughs> sorry to bore you guys. No, with that. dude, I love it. That's awesome. Um, could you share some tips on how you approach memorization and how to develop a muscle? Memory, ear training, um, or mental mapping to internalize music. Um, just like any, any tips you have for ear training, how to listen, memorizing parts. Um, Repetition? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I just play it. I don't make charts ever. Um, I, that's probably a really bad habit, but that's just me no. for me. If I don't know the song without a chart, then I don't know it well enough to play it, and I'd rather not just be a body on stage, so, or in a re recording studio, because that would suck. Uh, so yeah, I just, maybe I'll make some notes of like songs and like, oh hey, this is the song where this thing happens. I'll be like, oh yeah, that reminds me. But other than that, I don't, I just play it over and over until I know it. And that's also why I listen to the song a bazillion times, because if I know it in my head, then I'll know the cues of like where yeah. we're going and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, I'd like to state for the record that the chart situation on my end is purely for the learning process, right? Like I, my dad's a pretty brainy guy, and so we were talking one day, and he's like, he's like, yeah, like, I, like I want to see more multimedia stuff in church because simply hearing a sermon, like simply hearing information, uh, is one of the like least powerful ways to retain that information. The more senses you engage um, with, you know, ingesting material of some sort, um, the better chance you have of memorizing it. Like, science has proven this. So, for me, the chart is there to help me get it in the brain quicker, and then I just play it over and over and over and over in guitar, you know, on the guitar, if I have to drive to the grocery store or, like, to go buy guitar strings or something, like, I'll throw it on in the car, you know. Um, sometimes, if it, like, if it's a time crunch and I've got, like, a lot to learn in a little amount of time, I won't listen to other music. I will only listen to that stuff on repeat. That's good advice. Yeah, so just, like, repetition, repetition, repetition. Just, like, if you can get to the point where you are so tired of rehearsing it, you're going to slay it on stage, you know? Like, that that's my experience. And then you don't have to be the guy that's, like, knows in a chart book the whole time, or you don't have to look like a dummy with a music stand. 
I always thought music stands were like the least cool thing to see. You just have this big, large metal object that you're like, for me, like I'm an idiot. If you guys saw me clock myself with a microphone earlier, like like that, I'm just prone to that kind of stuff. So like, I'm gonna knock it over. The so less I, that could I be there for that. put myself in a position where I, if I don't learn this song, this is gonna be bad. <laughs> or being the guy where you're on stage and you're like barely hanging on. You're like, I don't think anyone can tell that I didn't practice that well, but I'm stressed. Sheesh. And you're yeah. like, trying to listen on your phone. You're like, how does this go? Oh no, and you're super nervous. Yeah, that sucks too. You're like that guy. It's, like... it's always the worst when you're, when you're um, playing, you know, like two or three worship songs in a set for the first time. And two of the songs have like really similar hooks. You guys ever have that problem? And you're like, wait, which hook for which song? Lion Lamb goes like this. How does that other one? Get? And then you, I always get them backwards, you know? Um, dude, also good. Uh, I've got a couple more, and then I think we can probably get into some guitar playing and then open it up for questions. But cool. um, let me see. Uh, all right, so like serving songs, playing together as guitar players specifically. Um, how do you balance playing like lead guitar, rhythm guitar? How do you communicate those things between each other? Like if you two were put like on a Sunday situation. You two were put on the same record, same service, whatever. Almost as if we were playing together this weekend. That's right. Hmm. <laughs> what would we do? How, did, how do you guys approach that? How casual is it? How, how much do you talk about it? You go. I go? Yeah. Well, we would probably sit on a couch like this one. Um, or, you know, if this was a, a, a normal Sunday for us, we would, one of us would call the other. Be like, hey, man, how's it going? Uh, yeah, dude, we're playing together Sunday. This is sick. Oh, dude, you're going to play your Strat? Cool, I'll play something with humbuckers. You know, we'll be different. Got all the tones covered, right? Um, hey, man, I saw we're playing, um, we're playing that Dante song. Do you want to, do you want to take Hislop's parts and I'll take Jay Lee's parts? Cool. Uh, or, you know, if it's, if it's a little more ambiguous, um, I'd be like, you know, hey, like, you know, what if I, you know, take the leads in the chorus and then you take the big lead in the bridge and we swap. Yeah. Like, that's something like um, Bobby Strand and I'd always try to do if we had to play, like, Cornerstone or something, right? Um, if he played the lead part in the chorus, then I would usually play the one in the bridge for two reasons. One, uh, it satisfies both, like, the rhythm and lead playing. I like playing both. I know some guys are like, I only want to play lead guitar. Some guys are like, I only want to play rhythm guitar. So there's that to work around. I like playing both. Um, and it's more musically interesting when you hear stuff, you know, kind of go back and forth and, and play on the different musicians. So I think it's really just as simple as, as communicating ahead of time as much as you can, um, knowing who you're playing with. You know, I've played with Shane before, so I know what he's capable of um, and vice versa. And so it's just as simple as be like, hey, like, I'll take this if you take that. And we're both pretty chill people in general, too. So it's like we're not fist fighting over who gets to play the solo or something like that, you know? So, yeah, just communication ahead of time. And if you're not able to do that, um, kind of like we were, like you were talking about, just watching and sound check or, or, or chatting really quick, you know, while the, while the front of house guys being like, hey, dude, can you retune that snare drum for the hundredth time this morning, that would be great. That's a great time for me to run over to Shane on stage and be like, hey, like, what are you playing on the song? Because I have no idea what's going on. So, yeah, communication. Yeah, definitely. And if you're playing, if you are playing with someone that you know really well, you can have those kind of conversations and pretty much be good to go Sunday morning and not really have to worry about it. If you're playing with someone who you don't know, you can usually have a talk about it and figure it out, or I'll just learn both. And then if something happens or somebody can't show up or someone doesn't know how to play guitar, then you can kind of figure out how to do. <laughs> I just had an experience like this recently where it was me and another guitar player and I showed up and I was like, oh, this guy doesn't know how to play guitar. <laughs> and so that kind of changed the, uh, the way that I would approach it and that I'm like, okay, well, now my job is to, you know, fill space. So how do I kind of play like I'm playing by myself? Um, so yeah, usually if it's with someone who I don't really know, 
and we've talked about parts. I'll learn mine, and then I'll have like a, a decent understanding of what their guitar part is and kind of what it's doing in the song. And then I can throw it in there. I can do a hybrid if I need to. Or, but yeah, other than that, just what Pope said, just good communication. And I do not care about lead or rhythm. It makes no difference to me. I don't care. It's all fun. It's all guitar. And the other thing, too, yeah. um, do you guys ever hang out with each other? Like, nerd out over guitars or drums or whatever? If you, like, you know, if, if you're playing with someone on Sunday morning and you guys have the time to, like, hang out and rehearse the parts together really fast, like, the more you prepare before walking into sound check or the set, like, the better it's going to be every time. So if you get, like, if you have the time and the ability to do something like that, like, turn it into a fun guitar hang. Like, dude, let's, let, let's cook some tacos and, like, nerd out over these guitar parts and, like, absolutely stomp on Sunday morning, you know? Just everybody gets saved because we <laughs> hung out, had tacos, and rehearsed our guitar parts, you know? That's yeah, awesome. the relationship definitely transfers over in the way that it sounds. If you play with people and you're comfortable and you're having fun and you're relaxed, it's going to be so much better than if you're not. And if you're scheduled to someone you hate, you don't have to hang out with them, you know? You just phone call, hey, man, uh, I'm going to take all the solos, and you can play chords. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> and then you, you go know? tell whoever's mixing, go, I hate that guy. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, I turn his it. guitar off in the mix. Just me. You just pull him out of the snake. Just me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, all great, dude. <laughs> Go, uh, going into, like, guitar tone, which I think is a big thing that you guys crush. Um, tone town. Tone town, baby. Um, how important do you think the, the actual player's technique is to creating great guitar tone? Just going to open a can. Just going to open a can. Yeah, you, you go. Cl clarify on your depends. It's like Keith Richards, <laughs> Tom Bukovac. Totally different. Yeah. Completely different technique and approach. Equally awesome. You know, I don't think Keith is the guy who's going to sit down and give Shred. you lessons. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Tom would give you lessons either. I think I think I YouTube think is it. Yeah, <laughs> you guys but gotta, he could. You guys got to tell people who don't know who Tom Bukovac T is. Tom Tom Bukovac, is. if you You've don't heard know, him. get on YouTube and look up Tom Bukovac homeschool, and he is kind of the premier session guitar player in Nashville. He's a big touring guy for a long time. Um, but whether you, whether you like the music coming out of Nashville or not, like, he's just one of those cats that's just, like, he's got it. He can, he can authentically, like, truly authentically play so many different kinds of music. Uh, and he's just, like, always plugged into that, like, creative spark, you know? Like, like, I would sit down with a guitar and just, like, noodle some pentatonic riffs or something and, like, all right, you know, whatever, do it. That guy sits down, picks up a guitar, and music comes out yeah, every time. Like, that's... Yeah. That's what I aspire to be like. I know Shane is the same way, and that's probably why we nerd out over players like that. But, yeah, Tom's, Tom's pretty great. I would argue that your technique is your tone. This stuff, like, like you know, when guitar players talk about tone, it's always in relationship to gear. Oh, man, that tone is sick. What amps are you using? What pedal is that, right? But the truth is, it's like, you can, you can make any of these things work. Um, <laughs> sometimes you go through fits of rage, like we were just talking about, we're in now where you, everything sounds bad to you. Every pedal <laughs> sounds bad. I just want to play through the amp, right? And next week I'll be like, oh my God, this benzene preamp is the sickest. Uh, but man, like, like work in a studio for, you know, a year or something, and you'll, you'll learn really fast, like your playing is your tone. You can never get away from the way you sound. Like, you always sound like you. I, I am only just now really realizing after playing guitar for, like, almost... It'll actually be 30 years. 30 years sometime this year I will have played guitar, which is crazy. I'm too old. So old. Um, but, but it's like... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just now, like... I, I'm gaining that, like, experiential revelation, right? We hear stuff about like that in churches, like, oh, it's one thing to just have like the head knowledge, right? But when you have the experience with the Lord, like then, then true knowledge. Well, same thing with guitar, man. It's it's like, like I'm only just now figuring out, oh, like all these things that I've not liked about guitar sound when I play, that's me. That's not 
me needing a new pedal, I don't need a different guitar, I don't need a different amp. Like, you know, I can, I can make any of this work for whatever I'm doing. Um, in most cases, you know, uh, there, there is gear that is uh, manufactured to do a specific thing. So it, ex some, you know, exclusions apply there. Um, but I, th I think some is this, better than others. Yeah, yeah. So, so, some is better than others for sure. But like, the, the the gear is there to do a job, and and really with this stuff, you're just looking for what agrees with your hands, right? right? Like, I can play this guitar through this rig, and we were doing it earlier. You might have been sitting in here for it. Like, like, our hands sound totally different, you know. Um, and so yeah, I would I would say that that your technique you're playing is your tone far more than any piece of gear or um, anything. And yeah, sure, you know, tone is in the hands, man. The way to use the most cliche, overstated thing. But it's, it's, it's so true. Um, and when you lean into that, like, stuff gets really fun. Because then it's, it's not about like, oh, like I, I have to find the one pedal that does everything. It's like, oh, all this stuff is available to me. I can use a Boss DS1 this week if I want. And I'll find something cool to do with it. Right, like if you if you can pull it off here, you can pull it off anywhere. So I, I think that's that's tone. If we're, if we're talking tone, that's that's tone. Well, and funny, like I going agree. going back to conversation we had earlier today. Like you had even mentioned that somebody else had played a guitar, and then as soon as you pick it up, you can feel like your hands are even brighter. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have bright yeah. hands. Like it gets that intricate as to what you're doing on your instrument. Like yeah. really matters. So that's awesome. Um, what what do you feel like you see like when when guitar players are chasing great tone, like what are some like mistakes or some like common pitfalls that you think guitar players fall into that? Um, oh, I think like Pope said, just getting um, hung up on the gear. I mean, gear is fun. I love gear. It's exciting. <laughs> I love I love buying gear. I love looking at it. I love trying it. But really, at the end of the day, it's just. Um, in between you and making music and either, I think a lot of people can get hung up on the equipment when really it's them that they need to work on, you know what I mean? You don't need a new pedal or a new guitar or a new amp. Um, those things can certainly help or they can hurt, like definitely. Um, but I think, yeah, getting hung up on that stuff rather than focusing on, you know, what can I actually do, how can I, uh, be better, et cetera. I think people get hung up on, on gear. Or they get hung up on uh, trying to be or sound exactly like somebody else. And I think that that's a really big pitfall. I think it's easy to do, too, because especially if you're like doing ear training or whatever, you end up trying to copy someone. And maybe you find somebody who you really, really like, and you go, oh, I love what they do. I want to sound just like them. But if that person sounded just like somebody else, then no one would listen to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I think being able to find your own sound yeah. in that process is really important. You know, I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> no, for for me, it's um, for me it was comparison. That was like one of the hardest things for for me to get over. That's um, a big one. I think a lot of people like you don't like the way they sound. Yeah, we I, had this conversation like yes. six months ago. I've I've felt the same way my whole life, and then I realized it was me. I was like, oh, I'm always gonna sound like this. So how do I <laughs> embrace it. it? Yeah, no. Yeah. Better better figure out how to make it work. No, like I I can think back to so many times in my life, in my 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 guitar playing life, um, where there was a part of me whether that was you know, creatively or mentally, spiritually, emotionally, or whatever, that shut off if I felt like someone was clearly better than me, you know? Um, or the flip side of that, which is, which is even more dangerous, is when you know you're the most capable guy in the room and there's a part of you that goes, oh yeah, that feels good, right? Um, One of the biggest lessons I've had to learn is in music, there is no better, there's no worse. Like all of this stuff is just opinion. You know, I love the new Morgan Wallen record. There's some great guitar playing on it. You could absolutely hate it, 
we can still I be. I do, actually. I'm oh, just kidding. Well, see, on. there you go. I was going to say, we could still be best friends, but now I changed my mind. <laughs> no, it, but it, it's, it's real, though. It's, it's like, you know, and, and even going back to the, the gear thing, how many times do you get on, like, Instagram or YouTube or something, and it's like, oh, man, like, you have to have this pedal and that pedal and that pedal because that's what, you know, the cool guys are playing, or the, the, you know, right? And if you don't have X, Y, and Z, you're, you're not enough, right? Um, that's, a, that's a big one, and that will hold you back one way or the other. Um, so yeah, be, be aware of the comparison pitfall. Like, learn to be cool with where you're at. Everybody started somewhere. Every musician you've ever looked up to, every musician you respect um, started somewhere, right? You've got to embrace the sucking period before you can get to the good period. And it's all just building a, a foundation. So as soon as you can just be like, nope, you know what? This is where I'm at. I'm okay with that. I'm forever a student of this instrument, so I'm just going to keep trying to get better. I think that's the. I think that's kind of the way to move forward. So yeah, that was it for me. Sorry, that was long-winded. No, that was good. And as soon as you get out of that phase of sucking, you'll find something new to suck at. <laughs> you'll be like, I'm going to learn how to play slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will never it's like, be good luck. Trucks. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> Turn no, it, the volume off. Well, and, and, and this brings up another argument, too, like the whole Keith Richards versus, like, Tom Bukovac thing. Like, like look at the, the difference between, like, an Eddie Van Halen, right, RIP, who um, I think most people would agree, like, that guy is, like, the pinnacle of guitar playing. Like, the general person out there thinks, like, guitar. It's probably going to be Eddie Van Halen. Like, he is one of the few people that truly changed the game, right? And he had the technical ability. Yep. Yep. Like, he had all the ability and, and all the stuff, right? And, and the 80s were like, you know, they're still regarded as, as like, amazing guitar period. But then what happened? Kurt Cobain showed up. Anybody like Nirvana? Talk about, like, talk about a, 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 a musician and a guitar player who doesn't have the skill, the technical know-how, the finesse, the, the stuff, but he changed music every bit as much as Eddie Van Halen, if not more, you know? So, you, like, your ability to, um, to play the instrument is not always so tied to, like, your ability to move hearts, right? Like, that, that's the whole point of this in the room. I, I, um, I have a, a, a saying that I, I just shared on the last tour that I was, move hearts, shake bums. That's, that's what I'm after. If I can make you dance in those seats and, like, move your heart and make you feel something emotionally, spiritually, whatever, like, like I just did my job. That's, that is success as a musician for me. So, um, I've, you know, that's not directly related to my skill. You know, I don't have to play the flashiest, most amazing thing you've ever heard to, to do that. Oftentimes, it's in the simple thing played tastefully like that's the stuff that moves hearts. So don't get so tied up in like your your ability. Yeah. Sorry. Move hearts, shake bombs. I'm right. just rabbit trailing now. Get that tattooed it, on my. That's a good point. Shake bombs. And to bring up Keith Richards again. Always. If Eddie Van Halen had played the intro to Brown Sugar, it would not be the same. Yeah. It would be wrong. <laughs> you know. Yeah. No um, one. No one can intro the church songs like you guys can. Okay. I'm gonna tell you that right now. No one can play the song the way you can and that's cool it doesn't matter if you wrote the parts or not i've spoken to so many guys um back when i like oversaw the guitar players at bethel i, I would have conversations with people all the time like well i just i don't really want to learn the parts on the song because like that doesn't feel like me i don't feel like i'm being true to myself i'm like bro you're playing the instrument like that's that's you like like <laughs> you're the one playing it what do you mean it's not you like <laughs> just because you have to be disciplined and like learn something and, 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 you know, perform that, that's not you being untrue to yourself. That's, like, you doing your job, you know, and, and, th and that's you serving the song and the, the band, right, and the, the, the music, serving the Lord. It's all that stuff. So you are you. You can't get away from it. Don't compare. Don't, don't fall into the gear pitfall. Don't do any of that stuff. Just be cool with where you're at because where you're at's pretty awesome, even if you don't feel like it is. If it doesn't sound good, just plugged into the amp, it probably won't sound better with pedals. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
<laughs> it's a good rule. Unplug the Ruby and plug into an AC30. That's right. <laughs> we'll prove That's that point, point in a minute. <laughs> um, I have one more question, and then we can get to plan. Um, feedback. Feedback and critique. Like, giving it, receiving it, what are some things that you've learned just through your time of playing? Obviously, records are high-stress situations, and, you know, playing live or any of those kinds of things are difficult and you're playing with a lot of people that have opinions and all that stuff like how do you how do you deal with feedback how do you handle it well and then how do you give it to somebody else that might be on your team that you're not necessarily a leader of but you're helping the music you know and the band ultimately be better I'd start by saying if you're not a leader maybe don't give it unless mm. you're asked mm. there's a lot of people that like to talk but don't have the experience or like the position to really say anything um, and those are always, like, not to say anything bad about anybody, but those are always the people that I, like, disregard the first. Like, uh, or, or you know, those people are the ones that I normally don't listen to. I'll just be like, cool, thanks, you know? If it's like, a, hey, man, you know, like, I just started playing guitar last week, and I really feel like you could use this, this jazz voicing instead of this other one, you know? I, I really want to hear that dominant seven chord ringing out. Be like, cool, bro. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Right? <laughs> no, but it, it's, it's it's true. Totally like, true. It's it's the same as like, um, I kind of treat this is this is my opinion. Um, I kind of treat prophetic words the same way. Have you guys ever gotten a prophetic word from somebody and you're like, oh, like I can feel when like this person is dead on, like this is the Lord saying something, versus like, oh, this person is just kind of coming up with this or like this just like they're trying but this like doesn't resonate with me like you can kind of sense and feel a, a difference there's something to be said about that I think with with criticism too um, but alongside that you know the sooner you learn to be okay with just accepting it um, doesn't mean you always have to follow through the follow through is is a different part if it's coming from leadership that's when the follow through is important but if you, if you can quickly learn to receive criticism um, and not just like emotionally destroy yourself upon getting the news that, hey, like you were a little bit out of tune this morning or, hey, I need you to learn that song better or whatever. Like if you can just get over the like initial shock of that, I think, which uh, for me that was really hard and I've spoken with a lot of people that had a hard time doing that. Maybe, you know, some of you guys are already good at this, but... Um, the quicker you can kind of just learn to get over that and be like, okay, like this is an opportunity to grow. Um, the great thing about any instrument is you're always a student, right? Like you get exactly out of it what you put into it. If I practice for 30 minutes a day, every day for a week, I'm gonna be better the next week and the next week and the next week as long as I do that. Criticism, if you, if you decide in your heart and your mind to take this as a, take it as a growing opportunity, you're always gonna be better off and it's a lot, um, it's a lot easier to not get um, offended or, or bummed out when a leader or someone who isn't a leader is like, hey, we need to talk. Yeah, yeah I agree. I definitely agree with the, if it's not your place, maybe don't say something. I used to be the uh, music director at Jesus Culture, and I remember when I first started, uh, some of my friends who played guitar there started getting some feedback from me, and they were like, why have you never said this to me before? And I was like, well, you never asked me. They're like, but I thought we were friends. I'm like, I'm not gonna tell you. Like, if you ask me, I'll give you my honest opinion, but it's not my place to just come up and start telling you every single thing that I think. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I've always... I've always liked the criticism, but I... But at the <laughs> Unicorn, dude. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe because I, I mean, I started playing uh, like professionally when I was really little, so maybe I'm just used to it. No. Um, but I definitely filter it depending on who's giving it to me. But I always ask, you know, whoever's in charge, hey, you happy? Do you need anything from me? Whoever's mixing, need any changes? If it's someone who I trust, it's, a, it's great. If it's not, then it's something that I can kind of take and go, I'm going to look into that and see if you're right or not, because you might be wrong. And then there's other guys where, you know, 
you can super trust them and know that if they tell you something, then like, okay, I can make that change. So yeah, kind of knowing who's telling you something, whether it's something that you should take stock in. And I think also just understanding that no one's, I mean, maybe sometimes certain people are, but I would say 95% of the time, no one's trying to hurt your feelings. Yeah. You know, everyone just wants it to be better. So yeah. I don't really, if someone tells me I need to change something, I don't care. I'll just yeah. change it. Sure. That's actually really good. Seeking criticism, like constructive criticism, is actually a, a really great telltale sign that, oh, this person's kind of got good motives with this, right? If you're, if you're seeking criticism, it kind of speaks that, oh, you want this to be better, you want to be better, you want the whole thing to be better, you care about this, you know? And then obviously if you're giving it, um, just trying to be really, really nice, maybe lead with something that somebody did good. Um, I know when I oversaw um, the, the guitar players at Bethel for a while, I have a tendency to be like a little bit cut and dry. Just, that's just how I am. And I had to kind of learn, hey, like, instead of just like, hey, here's all the things you did wrong, fix it. Uh, be like, hey, dude, man, when we got to the bridge of that song, that part you played sounded so epic. Like, what were you doing there? Like, if you play that song, please do that again. Like, like give people something to like, you know, feel good about and, and don't just leave them with like, hey, here's all the ways you need to improve. Like, um, this is a bad analogy, but it, it kind of works. It's <laughs> in some ways it's like, um, like, like any dog people here. <laughs> it's much easier to train your dog if you're like giving them positive reinforcement when they do stuff versus if you just beat them all the time. You know, I grew up in the backwoods, so people would just beat their dogs into submission. This is California, that would never fly. Pretend, you know, you're a dog owner in California. People are not dogs, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying positive reinforcement works. And if you can learn to fit that in with, oh dude, hey, um, that stuff is amazing. I noticed this area. Um, maybe if you tried using this kind of overdrive or you know, whatever it might be, hey, um, let me show you how that part goes so you can like super nail it next time. Like, just being a nice person and, and, and not just hitting people with, here's all the ways you suck. <laughs> goes a long way, I find. Yeah. The compliment sandwich goes a long way. I think another thing too is don't say anything unless you know what you're talking about. One thing I heard Chris say that I thought was really good advice was he said, I never, I never say something unless I know that I'm right. You know, and that can be pretty good advice to go by. That does sound like Chris, that's so extreme and absolute. Uh, but at the same time, like with guitar, you know, even when I was working with people, be like, have a solution if, you have, if you're gonna bring something up. Like, uh, I remember one of our guys, his guitar would always sound good through the amp, and then when he'd plug in through his board, it would just sound insane. It would just be super crunchy and really, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. And I'd always be like, hey dude, something's wrong, you know, and uh, be like, maybe, are you leaving your compressor on when you're playing chords and while you have overdrive on? And he'd be like, yeah. I'm like, well, I think that might be the problem. And so, you know, having a solution where you can try something out and at least offer something to help rather than be like, bro, that sounds bad. And then leave them with that. If someone says that to me, I'm just like, all right, well, that gives me nothing. I can't fix, I can't fix bad. But if they say, hey, it's too bright or it sounds too compressed or it's too yeah. dirty or not dirty enough or whatever, you know, having a solution if you're gonna give feedback goes a long way rather than just leaving someone with a critique. The goal is to make people feel like you're on their team, you're on their side. It's not me versus you, it's how can we together, the collective, just make this absolutely rule. So, yeah. That's awesome. Dude, um, first of all, can we thank these guys just for like answering questions and all that experience? It's awesome. Um, so we'll get into playing. I think we originally had like... What do you want us to play? <laughs> dude, we, we were in a text thread for the last like week and a half trying to decide how best to like showcase some of these things. Um, so obviously these guys are going to be playing Sunday. So if you're able to be here on Sunday, please be here. Um, I think one of the one of the big things we did want to talk about was like if you do get stuck in a situation where like, you know, you maybe had two guitar players or, 
you know, um, but somebody got sick or something went down and you only have one guy, like, um, how do you handle that? And then even just from there, how you guys interact and play with each other, and even if you want to use, like, a song or two from Sunday that we we're going to be doing um, to kind of exemplify that, however you guys feel best, that would be cool. Yeah. Well, like, we were talking earlier about the whole, like, you know, how to get things done as one guitar player. Maybe like, oh, man, Shane had to go to the bathroom and miss the whole set. <laughs> um, <laughs> True story, right? Always, man. It, it never fails. Side note: every every time you get on stage, it's like that's when you really have to use the bathroom, like in an in an emergent way, right? Um, <laughs> Mikey immediately. Yep. So, like what Shane was talking about earlier about like like listening to the whole song and not just learning like one set of parts, but learning two set of two sets of parts, learning like the entirety of the song. That comes in really, really helpful. Um, and I can't talk in. Well, I guess I can't talk and play at the same time. That's what microphone stands are for look at look at me man a true true professional we almost gave him um, headsets like uh, the, that's the what i wanted Britney dude Spears. backstreet's back let's go let's go <laughs> yeah sure Shane's yeah. going to the bathroom in case y'all were wondering <laughs> um no we were I, uh, we were talking about this earlier kind of prepping for this and um it reminded me of um there's a chris mcclarney song called hallelujah for the cross and um chris you know, he, he does, like, one or two trips a year, and I, I usually go because he's just, like, the best hang. Uh, but that song, you know, has, has two pretty clear guitar parts, like, right right out of the bat, like, in the intro. Uh, and I think it demonstrates um, how you can play two different parts at the, the same time, and we can break this down a little bit more. But basically, if you've heard that song, you've got one guitar part just... Right? Holding that down. And then you've got another guy on top. With that top line, right? Playing it, and then later on the song, it, it jumps the octave. So um, one thing that's really, really great to practice is like, oh, like, how many, how many songs can I get through where I, like, play both parts at the same time? Like, can I... delays sync it sound even better right thank god for delay um but just doing little things like that and like all right like if if that's the intro and i gotta jump the octave right you can it's pretty easy to keep that little static note going and then I'm just using my, my middle finger to, to kind of pick out those other notes, right? So that's a, a really great thing to practice. Um, you can do that with a, a lot of songs. Um, Shane, do it on the bridge. Uh, trickier right no no but th but that's the thing it's like unless you unless you try that stuff like out you don't know what you can get away with and so so like for that song um you know a good example because we're already here right i know i can if i throw on a reverb and an approximate delay by the time to fill out all that space, right? So keeping, keeping the effect a little bit more chill. Sorry, it's hard to reach pedals while I'm sitting like this. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a poor execution. Um, but yeah, just, just trying different ways to kind of incorporate that stuff. And then even like, 
like these things are tools, right? So like that's a great situation to 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 use more effect. You know, you're gonna have a bass player. Hopefully they, you know, have cool bass tone and there's some mid-range there. I always call it bass guitar, right? They're almost like a, a rhythm guitar where you don't have to be. Uh, so that song is, you know, an easy example. And then you can, I mean, even you've got the, um, by the time we get to the, the, the real bridge, because I guess that's the chorus and you're talking about the bridge, the... Um, that whole thing, right? Uh, you could, like, maybe the way to do that, all right, playing it up high sounds kind of weak after I've been up there for the chorus. I need that bridge to get bigger. Well, that's what a pog is for. We know who the pog fans are. My switch is broken, so... Right, it's adding that extra octave. That's why that's why you see pogs everywhere. It, you know, it's it allows me to be two guitar players, right? Rather than having to go. Um, now it won't turn off. There we go. Thank you, TSA. Right, it, it, you know, so much easier to to play a pog on one note as a doing the big octave thing, right? Like that, that would be difficult. So, you know, when you when you can't quite maybe play both parts at the same time. Obviously, you can't do that every time, right? Um, you can use these things and maybe an extra digit or two to not just like... Right? Sometimes the choruses are cool. Maybe that's what you need to do. Um, another thing that is, is really great um, is just uh, fitting that little melody into like your normal triad shapes. Like that's one of the easiest things you can do as a player. Um, and, and Shane like reminded me of like uh, Bobby's guitar part in Forever. Uh, you know, I'm doubling that vocal line on slide and he's. If you know that song, you can pick out the vocal melody in that you know, r rhythm part, right? So th there's all kinds of things you can you can do as a guitar player, thanks to pedals and extra fingers. Yay. Fingies. Yeah, fingies. <laughs> fingies. Extra fingies. Um, that you can do to, to get by as, as one guitar player. Like, you don't just have to resort to um, being the rhythm guy the whole time. And, and people don't want to hear that, too, because um, it's usually... It's usually, um, if you're a guitar player, I would say seven times out of ten, your part is, the, is what's making the song musically recognizable, right? Um, if I'd go... That wasn't my part, so I messed it up. But you guys know what song that is, right? That was right? Lion of the Lamb, right? Right? Like, like, the, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> Don't make me play it, Austin. <laughs> we already made him play it once today. <laughs> we, can, we can dive into that one later. Um, <laughs> a lot of trauma with that one. Do you remember the For time? For not just you, actually. Too. Do you remember the time we played that song and you accidentally played it a half step low and everyone thought it was me? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm so glad that happened. <laughs> And then you emphasized it by <laughs> pointing at Shane. Like, I just that was kept looking at. Yeah. I just kept looking at him like it's not me. But of course, that, who were they going to think it was? <laughs> when you're when you're when you're playing loud guitar, very, was it in the morning or was it at night? I think it was for a conference. Oh well, then no excuse. That is my bad. They were like, "Is it the guy who wrote it or the turd next to him on stage?" <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the guy that wrote it. <laughs> that that song in particular. Um, you know, you know when like you have like there's like a song that like six different leaders are gonna lead and they all do it in like different keys. Like half of them are just like it's like oh you know he does it in A she does it in B he does it in A flat this person does it in B flat they do it in D they're a weirdo like <laughs> like how do you how do you sing that you know it, like when you play it in a ton of different keys you 
forget. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Shane. No, it's all good. We're good. He's not gonna sleep tonight. You haven't been harboring like stuff in your heart towards me this whole time. No. Okay. Good. It it goes back to that. Even if it had been me, it's like huh, I could have dealt with it. It's fine. What a pro. It's not a big deal. What a pro. But I do remember in the back, everyone being like, "Oh, we totally thought that was you." I'm like, "No, it wasn't me. <laughs> I practiced this time." <laughs> That's very good. So yeah, Shane, do you have it like? Can you, and if you have playing examples, um, we're, we're using amplifiers now, um, so get it while you can. Do you have any, like, playing examples of, like, <laughs> how you would cover a lot of ground as one guitar player? Um, I, don't know. I don't know if I do. I, I mean, you covered it pretty well. It kind of depends on the song and the situation, so it's one of those things that's, like, hard to just, like, yeah. pull up in the in the moment like this, but... I was trying to think of one. I don't know why I'm grabbing my guitar, because I couldn't think of one. But I know that there's definitely been times like that where uh, there are certain songs where I'll be playing by myself, and I kind of have my own version of both parts put together into one. Yeah. Kind of like what you were showing, like what Bobby would do on Forever, where it's a mix of some sort of rhythm with like a lead melody added. And like we were talking earlier, maybe Maybe in a song, there you're by yourself and you're trying to figure out what to play. I think generally, I mean, it also depends on the song, but in the verse, I'll try to play whatever is heard. And then in the chorus, I'll try to play whatever fills out the, like whichever part is filling out the most space and supporting the song. And then if there's like a really prominent like hook or a lead part, I'll try to fit it in, you know. Yeah. I'll, I'll say, too, on that note, I, I like what he said. I'll just try to play what's heard, obviously. Like, how many times have you tried to, like, accurately learn the parts on, on a church record? And you're like, I can't hear what they're playing. Well, is it is it good to, you know, go on the deep dive, learn learn the proper parts? Sure, yes. But at the end of the day, all that truly matters, it, nine times out of ten, is that you nail the vibe doesn't quite matter if you play the part exactly like it is on the record because nothing about performing that song on stage is going to be exactly like the record. Maybe the tracks if you have a tracks rig, but the drum kit's different, the drummer's different, the bass player's different, like every, everything else is different, right? Um, and so you're, you're always retrofitting as a musician, right? Um, so when you're listening and you're learning to those songs, like part of learning the arrangement and the progressions and the parts like we talk about is, is paying attention to like what you can hear, what sticks out to your ear, what goes, oh, I can hear that. That's not a soul. Well, that's probably something that's important to play. Like if it, if it was something that the, the artist and the mix engineer deemed to be loud enough in the mix for you can hear, that means it's got more important than the little guitar part that's just like, you know, buried in the background. Right, so that's another thing just to keep in mind when you're working on songs and, and you know, figuring out, okay, like, you know, so-and-so is sick, I, I have to play guitar by myself. What are the parts that jump out and, and like, are really heard, and then how can I kind of bridge those gaps? Dude, also good. Um, so before we get to, like, Q&A and stuff, uh, and I'm probably going to put you guys on the spot by doing this, but if we could just get, like, Let's say like 30, 40 seconds, maybe a minute of you guys playing something together, whether that be kind of what you were doing earlier, um, yeah, jamming on some Trip the Witch or whatever you guys you are feeling, and we could just kind of hear these guys stretch out just a little bit. I think just for fun, I think it'd be cool. Yeah, I would love to hear these guys play a little bit. Especially Guitar Shane. swap. Where's your tech, bro? I did I did exactly one tour in my life with like an actual guitar tech and I felt incredible. <laughs> you would not believe how good it feels to have somebody go like that <laughs> on stage and not have to put your own guitar down. I was like, dude, do you want to like take it off of me as well? That would be really great. <laughs> I'm just going to stand here while you take like, my turns guitar up from me. Your volume knob for yeah. you and like I want I want the full treatment. 
cool. So I guess all we're gonna do, Shane's gonna play some chords, and I'm just gonna try yeah, let's and just play for make a little it up bit. along. Let's do some So that was gonna, fun. We should actually do that, like intentionally. That's how we're gonna point. start Sunday morning. We actually, <laughs> Shane and I were so inspired by that trip to Witch Record. We were like, we should do our own. And I keep meaning to send yeah. you that that Bender part and be like, do something with this. That that was one of my ideas for that. Oh, dude. So we're gonna. Now we got to work it out. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Stay which, tuned. Record that's another record. Soon. If you're interested in listening to great guitar tone, great musicality, Trip the Witch, it's a Tom Bukovac record. Yeah, it's it's, it's Buk and um, a guy named Dean DeLeo, who's a guitar player for a band called Stone Temple Pilots. Um, if you're an STP fan, or if you're not an STP fan, Trip the Witch is nothing like that. So still check it out. It's just cool music. And it's all instrumental, too, so it's yeah. easy to throw on. That's probably a good thing to 
make mention of too is anyone who's made their mark, I think, on worship music as a guitar player, like Pope or I don't know. I feel like there's probably like four or five guys, like you, Bobby, Jeffrey, um, James, Stugy, Duke. people like that. Stugy, yeah, James, yeah, Stugy who have like sure. really kind of put their thumbprint on it. Uh, I don't know any of they all listen to other music. They're not like, yeah. dude, you gotta listen to this worship record. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like listen to the guitar on this. You know, they all listen to real guitar players, and then that transfers and finds its way into the music. So just be a music fan. Yeah. Don't don't yeah. feel shame for liking what you like, and don't feel like you only have to learn church songs because you play in church. Like you don't have to have a bar gig to learn Skinnerd songs, or like right. just just learn the music that you love to listen to. Um, and that will make you better on stage still, like every time, like, like growth is growth, you know, and it all works out in the end. Yeah. Dude, cool. Um, any questions? Yeah, let's go. Speaking of growth, um, what practice habits, healthy habits do you guys recommend, especially in the area of soloing to be able to improve and continue to grow you're better at soloing than i am so you should take this i one. don't think that's I, true side, side, uh, side note <laughs> one of my favorite it's probably one of my biggest joys in life is when somebody comes up to me like dude the solo on that josh baldwin song abraham dude i love that solo and i get to go <sighs> you know thanks but that that wasn't me that was my good friend shane tiller who's twice as good as any church guitar play you've, you've ever heard, times a, times a billion. Um, so this guy, dude, your solos blow my mind. I'm like, I could never think of that or Thank you. do that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, oftentimes people <laughs> will mention to me how good of a job Pope did on that solo, and I never <laughs> correct them. <laughs> I'm always just like, you're right. He did a really good job. <laughs> as he's patting himself yeah. on the back. That's a good He's friend. getting better. <laughs> really trying, man. Really trying. Um, as far as practice with soloing, I don't know. You know, I get asked that a lot. I just wouldn't worry about it. I mean, as far as practicing, I try to play at least an, <clears throat> an hour a day. And that's just for me. You know, I think that's good practice for anyone. You'll, you'll never put in an hour a day and not get better, you know, and not see results. But as far as practicing soloing... I don't know. I, I feel like it's almost just a byproduct of playing guitar. Like the soloing will happen. I just try to practice or play along the stuff that moves me or that I enjoy listening to or uh, maybe it's something that I would want to grab something from and have it be something that I'm able to do. So I'll just play along and try to learn how to do that. And then if I learn how to do something cool soloing in the process, then I will, you know. Um, but if you want to work on soloing, I think some really good things that helped me were working on phrasing, um, working on not overplaying. You know, I can play a blues solo and easily have three or four bars of just nothing, <laughs> where you just don't play at all. I mean, if you listen to B.B. King, he does it all the time. It's amazing. So those are some good tips for, for practicing soloing, working on phrasing, not overplaying. Um, almost treating what you're playing rather than like, oh, look at this riff I know. It's almost like trying to play it like a conversation, you know what I mean? It's kind of a back and forth. Um, and that's just part of phrasing. Yeah. I don't know, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it, this is always a funny one for me because I've never, I, I didn't have the natural inclination to be like, oh, I want to be the guy that solos and shreds. It's, it's always like I always hear an incredible solo or an incredible moment in a solo or a lick or, or a piece of it I'm like, oh my God, I have to figure that out. Like, that's amazing. So I think just kind of like following your heart and your own musical taste and like letting that inform you as a soloist because soloing on any instrument, like that is purely your voice. You know, you could learn a solo note for note, um, but like what, what we were just doing, like we're, that's, that's overflow of, of what we're hearing, what we're feeling, what we're experiencing. Um, and to, to practice that, it's just like, man, you just kind of, you just kind of have to throw on a, a backing track that might be the, you know, the closest to the vibe that you're going for and just, just go at it, man. It's, it's, it's time spent. Um, I think the advice of like, uh, 
trying to think like a singer, like if you were the vocalist, like what would you sing in that moment? Um, uh, you know, a guitar player like John Mayer is kind of a, a, a perfect example of that. Um, and maybe because he's, you know, kind of the, the, the lead vocal as well. Um, but guitar is absolutely a vocal instrument. And um, the more you can think melodically and less just like the pentatonic box that we all go to. Nothing, I love pentatonic. Um, I always hate when guys rip on someone like Joe Bonamassa because I'm like, man, he makes that so musical and, and awesome. So there's a, there's a place for it. Um, but just follow your heart and, and think melodically. He's fantastic. And he's so good. He's it's a fantastic unbelievable. guitar player. He's so good. Yeah, he, he does not deserve the, the fun that people make of him. I don't think so either. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. So, yeah, follow, follow your heart with that, man. If, that's, if you want to rip blues, just find your guys, dive into it, spend the time learning it. You know, if you want to solo like, you know, Jeffrey Cundy, learn your inversions and, you know, figure out how he's doing it. You know, it's, just, it's all time spent. You're, all, you're always just moving closer and closer to that, like, 10,000 hours mark, so... Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Go for it, Kyle. You don't need a mic, dude. Yeah, dude. Put this dude on record, dude. Fire him up a track, dude. No, it's more for me. I'm going to watch this back later. Um, mine's kind of, kind of two parts. One for Michael. Uh, how, is there anything you notice that you've heard a lot from front of house guys throughout the years of touring and sessions? And then one for Shane kind of the same thing because I know you have some production experience and some front house experience. Is there anything that you noticed you said to guitar players a lot, like, as far as tone is concerned? Uh, just, like, I guess common pitfalls or things you noticed you had to tweak a lot. And, Shane, you can speak on it as a guitar player, too, of course. Yeah, I, it, it, it kind of depends on the player. Um, the advice that I would get from Greeley or engineers a lot, um, and I'm, like, Shane, I'm the guy that, like, <laughs> like even on this, on this tour that I just did with... Um, and we were opening for Mercy Me, and their front of house guy, who was like a fill-in, was doing front of house for us. So like every day, I would go out and listen to him tune the PA to try to get a feel for the room, to basically figure out how much reverb I'm going to use <laughs> that day, because <laughs> Taya's songs had a lot of swell stuff in it, right? Um, so just kind of communicating on 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 that level. Um, but then, man, it's. How do I phrase it the right way? I, I think for me, I've always gravitated towards darker tones, um, and that's just my taste as a player. So the feedback I would always get was, hey, man, can you make that brighter? So just from being asked that over time, um, I have kind of naturally learned, like, oh, like, if I set my amp where I think it sounds perfect, and then just, like, up the treble knob a little bit, you know, or whatever it might be. That's kind of the trick that's worked for me, or maybe scooting that microphone just a little bit closer to the center. Um, you know, it's, it's just kind of you kind of interpreting that feedback you're, you're getting and maybe looking for that feedback. But for me, that's what it is. I think it's different for every guitar player. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that was the big one for me. I'm like, take me to murky town, dude. I want it to be dark and I want to sound like Eric Johnson. Um, and they're like, that doesn't cut through a mix. Like, you're playing with another guitar player and, like, a hundred layers of synthesizers. So, good luck, bro. You need mids and top end. So, yeah. Yeah, I have the same problem. Uh, I would always get told, your tone is so dark. I can't hear you. Uh, but my ears are super sensitive to high frequencies. Anything, like, 2K to, like, 6K just destroys me. And I play t a telly. <laughs> so, <laughs> confused. I'm a confused man. Uh, but what I do is I always just set my guitars with the tone knob down, and I get the amp where I like it. And then if, like, I need more top end, I'm like, here you go. Or I have an EQ pedal. Yeah, I can give EQ you a little more pedals, top end guys. if you want it. Or yeah. I can run back there and check the microphone, see where the mic's at, like Pope said. Um, and usually just go from there. Maybe it's something on the board. There's like a million factors it could be. But I always check with the guitar and the amp first and the mic, and then kind of go from there before I start messing with pedals. Um, what was the other part of the question? Things we've encountered? 
uh, from your experience, I know you've done some front of house, like for JC and such. Was there stuff that you noticed you yeah. said to guitar players, like trend, like trend wise? Like, was there something oh, right. like, I say this? Oh, like oh, I say this a lot to all of our different guitar players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like coming. So I took Jeffrey's old job when he moved to San Diego. So coming in after him, like Jeffrey definitely has a sound and a style. And I, I always tell him this. I'm like, when you do your thing, it sounds amazing. When other people try to do your thing, it sounds terrible. Like it just never sounds good. And so we had a lot of problems with people's tone being way too dirty, uh, setting the amps way too hot. You know, they just had no headroom. They had nowhere to go. Uh, yeah, they didn't really understand. Like, Jeffrey is really sensitive with his right hand, and so he can make an amp that's cranked clean up because he's really gentle, or he digs in. You know, he has that dynamic with his right hand, um, but not everyone else did. So there was that, usually too bright, because they're like, AC30s, rah, and they just crank the treble in the cut. You're supposed to turn the treble knob all the way up, right? All the That's way how up. It works. Yeah, it's hundred <laughs> percent. Mine's usually like toe I don't... knob all the way up. Ah, no, sorry. Um, Pope has it set where I usually have it set. Just. That's the, that's the dark setting for this room. I would, well, volume down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Typically, well, they're all different. About a quarter of the way up. That's how you set it. Typically. Well. I turn it. They're all different. You never know. Every AC30 sounds completely different. I'll usually start with them all straight up, and then I'll sweep through each knob to see what they're doing. Okay, because they are all different, especially the cut knob. Yeah. The filter on the cut knob, the threshold is always different. It's doing nothing. It's doing nothing. It's doing nothing. It's still doing nothing. How is it still doing? Oh, there it is. Yeah, I've played AC30s too, where you basically turn the treble off, and you're like, and you just use the cut knob, and you're like, oh, perfect. Um, I think another problem that we would encounter was too much reverb, too much delay, too much compression. Just kind of like, I don't know, have you ever taken your board and just turned on all your pedals? It doesn't sound very good, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're pretty far away from what you would hope that, sorry, I haven't even looked over here. Uh, what you would hope that your, <laughs> sorry guys, uh, your guitar would sound, there we go. I used, it's pretty sick, I used actually. to tell That's one of sick, I used to tell one of our guitar players I'd say, "Bro, he's like one of my best friends. Say, I love you. You you sound like Jimi Hendrix when he did the Star Spangled Banner, and I love that sound. <laughs> but but the Lord doesn't. Yeah, but in Cornerstone, it's just not really working. You know, the Lord's gonna pass. Uh, so I think those were usually pretty common things. Just kind of figuring out how to set your delays and verbs, especially with, you know, repeats and mix on delay and reverb. It changes in every room. Like, no matter where you go, you always have to change them, you know? That's why the, the like, preset thing is like, well, I get it. And it gets you close, but you still have to make changes yeah. depending on, yeah. am I playing by myself? What kind of room am I, am I playing in? You know, at Jesus Culture, we would switch at the high school between the theater and the multi-purpose room and you had to make changes every single time you would switch because it was just never the same so those are pretty common things that we would run into yeah. amps gained up too high compressor always on like wait which is you can get away with in the right setting and if you need to sometimes you need it like yeah. right now i have it on because the amp's a little quieter but i have uh i have the attack all the way slow and the release all the way fast. So it's just not really doing that much. It's just giving me a little, little juice. Little juice. Got that yeah. juice, dude. Yeah. That's another thing too. If you're using a compressor pedal, you should under <laughs> have a good understanding of how compression works, you know, and like yeah. what you're actually doing with it. And then have an understanding of like what your pedal's doing and like if it has, this is a deep six, if it has an attack and release, be like, which way is fast, which way is slow? You know, you can turn the mix all the way up and listen to what it's doing and then take it back and kind of dial it in. Yeah, the compression is a big one. That reminded me of a, a thousand conversations I had with Bethel guys. Like, bro, uh, if you like, think about what a compressor does for a minute. And, and I think a, a compressor is the fastest way to screw up your guitar tone. Because if you think about your sound as a waveform, right, you've got high peaks, loud volume, right? And you've got 
low volume little things, right? And so what a compressor does is it takes those loud things and it squishes them down, right? It makes the waveform smaller. And then uh, um, it'll also make the quiet things louder. It just kind of levels everything out. So you go from having this big range of sound, which you want as a guitar player, you want to sound big and awesome, especially in, in church music. The more you compress that, the smaller you make your guitar tone, right? And so knowing how to how to dial your compressor in a way that's like actually beneficial for your tone um, is is kind of a super important thing. It, it, it highly dependent on the pedal that you're using. If you're new to it, try to get something with a blend knob. I always recommend that to people because then you can kind of blend it in um, and you can kind of maybe get a more aggressive setting. I feel like compression is often hard for people to hear. Um, it's easier to feel than hear. But once you learn mm -hmm. to hear it, you can you can really figure out how to dial it in. So start with some of the like a blend knob and, and like set it to to where you can hear it and then turn the blend mm -hmm. like almost off and just like listen for it kicking in and giving that squish, you know. But that's that I had that conversation with almost every player at Bethel. Like, hey, like turn your compression down because you're just squashing your tone and it just you just sound like a duck the whole time, just quacking away up there, dude. Am I on? Oh, it'll kind of end up sounding like uh, like a piezo pickup. Yeah. But you can kind of hear the difference. I have the blend cranked. Here's with the attack slow, so it takes the longest time to engage the compressor, and then it lets go as quickly as possible. <laughs> Hear how he's able to adjust the volume with his playing, right? And also hear all that beautiful top end he got back. Like. Here's the opposite. Duck. And your Norse four came up. You can hear it squeezing, you know? Which is cool if you're doing like a. Cool as an effect and um, use it sparingly if it's always on. Like if you got a, if you have like a really tired tube amp, that's how I, that's if I had a compressor always on, it's always because I had like a really tired sounding backline amp. Um, you just want like a little bit in there just to give you a little bit of that like sustain and squish, like when an amp is just going hard. What do you mean by tired? tired uh, just like old tubes and kind of saggy and like not. Not like, this is going to, how do I describe this? This is a feel. Um, so uh, uh, so hard to... you may have heard people talk about um, vacuum tube amplifiers. <laughs> <laughs> to get real technical here. They, they compress naturally, right? That's what we like. That's why we like these things over these things. Because when we play harder, they give a little bit and kind of spring back. That spongy thing is cool. When you exaggerate it with this, it can be too much. Is that a is that a good way of explaining it, Austin? It can, it, it just like you have too much compression. Your sound is too small. You're getting that quacky thing. Like it, it just it just doesn't feel great. So when a tube amp is tired though, and it's not you know it's kind of sounding a little bit dull. It's not compressing very well. Maybe it has brand new tubes. Maybe they're groove tubes, and it feels really stiff. You ever get a brand new Fender with groove tubes in yes. it, and it's just like the most like sterile harsh thing you've ever heard yeah um you know if you're if you're if you're playing through an amp you don't normally play through or something that for me that was when i would use compression to just kind of give a little bit of that squish and that like tube amp in the zone feel right there's a lot of amps too like maybe you maybe you have um uh, an ac15 which you need a clean sound out of but that amp doesn't have a great clean sound so you got to turn the volume way down your feel's gone, you can get a little bit of that back with a compressor, so. There's a long awesome. compression spiel for yeah. the nerds. I love it. The it's nerds. good to know about, you know, because I feel like it's kind of like the most committed sin. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> like that and too much reverb yeah. are 
just I can't speak about that one. Repeat offenders. <laughs> Guilty as charged. You think so? Yeah. I'm I listen talking like I listen back to a lot of the stuff that I've played on sometimes, at least the Bethel music stuff. Um and I'll I'll pin Greeley for it. It's his fault. He mixed the records and like signed off. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. But I think I listened back and maybe this is just like that self critical thing we were talking about, but I'm like, oh man, I wish I would have used a little bit less of yeah. some stuff on that, you know. Well, I think it was stylistic for the time too. I always think you sounded great. I'm talking Thanks, more man. like out of context. Like if I go rip a blues solo with a cloud reverb on, <laughs> that's not cool. You know? <laughs> that's like sushi with barbecue like sauce. That. It's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just got saved. It's just not right. <laughs> I think you just made that riff awesome. better. <laughs> <laughs> but there's definitely context for tones. Yeah. You know. No, that's that's so true. Yeah. That's another that's another thing though. Yeah, that's the next clinic. Yeah. Um so we got like ten more minutes. Uh any other questions? Yeah, yeah. more questions. Okay, uh, what do you look for when you go to buy, like, a drive or a compressor? You know, if I'm going to buy a pedal, um, I was just I was just kind of Falling apart bragging. Right? Yeah, dude, are you right my, over there? Yeah, my power tube is loose still. Oh, so. dude. Get those groove tubes out of there, dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably sagging. Um, I, so I did this thing. I, I feel like um, I'm a bit of a weirdo. I'm, like, not a social media guy. Like, I don't... That's just not my forte. And, um, and I have this thing where, like, as a guitar player, I feel constantly bombarded, whether it's Instagram or YouTube or wherever, where it's just like, you got to buy this pedal. Look what just came out. This is available. Like, check out this overdrive. Check out this reverb. Check out this compressor. Check out this delay. Like, have you seen the new version of the timeline? It's 100 times better than the old version of the timeline. And it's got the big sky in it, too, now. So you can do the two, you know, two sounds in the one pedal, and it's great. Buy it. It's, you know, twice the price, twice the pedal deal yay hooray it's constant and it's it's overwhelming and there's so many pedals out there um i i did a thing recently where i, I like unfollowed every pedal thing every whatever so for me now if i want to figure out what pedals are available like i have to go to a guitar store and so now my only criteria for am i going to spend the 299 on this overdrive is does it make me absolutely stoked when I turn it on? If it if it doesn't, um, and at this point, it's like once you hear enough of them, it's like nothing really like blows your mind. But if I don't get that creative spark, that initial like, ooh, I can do something with this, like that's that's cool. Um, I don't I don't buy it anymore, you know, it, it, unless it's like, oh, they want like fifty dollars for this obscure vintage thing that I could get eight hundred dollars for in reverb right now. You know, buy that one. You know, yeah, flip, flip that sucker, dude. That's just called garage sailing, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's called Craigslist, man. <laughs> what a what a place that is. Uh, but yeah, man, all, all I'm for looking Craig. for if I'm buying a pedal is like, like, does it give me, does it give me the juice? Like, does it make me excited when I step on it? Because there's nothing worse than being like, wah, wah. Yeah, it's, 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 eh, I don't know about that one. You know, these things are too expensive now to not love what's on your board, so. Yeah, find the stuff you, you really dig, and if that's expensive, then save up for it and do what you got to do. If it's cheap, that's cool, too. You lucked out. You found a, a good cheapie. But, but, yeah, that's really my only, like, I mean, beyond pedals. It's, like, my only gear requirement anymore. It's, like, if there's not, like, a specific job that I need it to do, does it excite me? Does it make me, like, want to make music? Yeah. It's awesome. Shane, did you have anything? About buying pedals? No. <laughs> I, I don't follow any pedal companies on social media either. Look I just don't us, know. Bro. I think uh, the only... I follow some music stuff. I just don't... 
I don't really care about guitar pedals. I usually wait until Pope is selling something, and then I go, ah, I'll try that. That's how you <laughs> sell you it to that. me. That's how you bought that pedal you don't like. <laughs> and yeah, and I fell victim to that, like, this is the new thing. You got to get this. And I, Pope got it, and then he got rid of it, and I went, I'll try it. And then I go, oh, I see why he got rid of it. <laughs> Didn't didn't uh, the post office send that thing to Guam for like three weeks? Yeah, it went to Guam before it came to me. I, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't, I just don't like pedals that much. I feel like every pedal I get and try out, I'm usually like, eh, oh, that's fine, whatever. Um, there are some, I mean, I got a memory, man. I really like that. That's a great pedal. But that's kind of one of those more like, like a holy grail kind of piece of gear. You know what I mean? Um, other than that, I don't, I don't change stuff that much. I mean, I've had this Deep Six compressor forever. They're not really like, I don't think people are like, oh my gosh, you have to get this. But I like it and it works for me. So if I'm not moved by a piece of gear or excited about it, then I don't get it. And if you do get something and you don't like it, you can always sell it. Is the Memory Man like what you're fired up about? Is that like the pedal you have you're fired up about right now? And I say that to say, like, should you show them what an oh, actual yeah, I can show them what it sounds like? like? I think that's Cy. Was, <laughs> you guys want to hear all the like going to be like, no, not really. Like, uh, no, this pedal sucks. I have the, to fix it every other week. <laughs> the pedal I'm excited about is that Altec console that I just bought. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. <laughs> This way to fix your tube amp if it's messing up is just to hit it. Just beat on it. Man, that thing's really hanging out. It's the power too, just is it loose. tired? No. Uh, <laughs> turn, turn up the mix and uh, add more vibrato. The modulation on these things is where it's at. Disappears. There, there, no delay will sound better than that. <laughs> we had to hear the memory man. Yeah. Do me, do me a favor, only because I'm curious now. This setting is supposed to be like a memory man setting. So, okay. like, give me, uh, let's do like a, a B chord or something. Just give me a stab so I can hear the reverse. Wait. Check, check. Hey. Yes. It gets closer than I thought it would. Yeah. It's Mystery solved, everybody. Thanks for going on the journey with us on that <laughs> one, man. <laughs> Lots of stuff sounds cool through I mean, I mostly do uh, producing stuff now, so it was kind of more of like a utility pedal. I could use it on anything. So Throw it on really a like hardware it. insert. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We recorded a lot of roads Ooh. with the Memory Man. Yes. That probably or was Wurlitzer. Cool. It wasn't a road. I did a track one time. We did a... Um, a Moog Voyager, 
in stereo with a memory man on each output. And while, um, uh, while one guy played the synth, um, I played the memory mans and modulated the time. So you got all the weird space sounds. It was fun. Yeah. Tricks, story. Cool, dude. Sorry, do we have more questions? We're just yeah. rambling at this point. It's like. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, totally. Man. So notice that you guys both have EQ pedals on those boards. Um, how do you use EQ, like, between working in a studio, just practicing by yourself, versus playing a gig, adjusting to different guitars, that kind of thing? This is the best question. I love EQ pedals. All right, man. Well, hit Shane's is a little more complicated. Um, but so, like, right now for this, um, really easy live application. This is just a stock um, bossy key you can buy at, at Guitar Center, as is. I haven't done any of the cool guy mods to it yet. Maybe I'll jump into that at some point. But um, right now, it's just a little bit of a mid boost. So I, I have like a bit of the 800 just notched up and a little bit more volume. Um, so I'll, I'll try and demonstrate. It's kind of like uh, EQ is cool because you can you don't have to add a lot of gain. I'm I'm adding a little bit here because I like a bit of a volume jump with it. Um, but it's a really great way to just like jump out of a mix all of a sudden. I can lay back for a rhythm part, step on that, and then I'm like not super gainy, but I'm sticking out a little bit more because I got that mid range thing. You can also do like um, you know you can kind of goose it and do weird like lo fi stuff, which is cool. Right, like that kind of stuff um, when you're recording is cool. Oftentimes, like with guitars, like if you do like a really kind of small mono guitar and like pan it all, all the way out to the side, you can get really cool sounding stuff. Or that's even cool for like, um, you know, like if you're going from a, a verse to a chorus, like it's a it, kind of an exaggerated bit, but having a small tone and then jumping to a bigger tone could be really cool, you know. Like, So, I mean, there's just a million rad things you can do with EQ. You're thinking like a producer. Hey, look at me, producer guy. Big producer guy, man. Yeah, how do you... So, um, the difference between these EQs, this um, this EQ, wow, yours is parametric, mine is, why am I blanking? Graphic, boom. Um, so, a graphic EQ is really cool for, like, pinpointing a specific frequency. Shane's is cool because not only can he pinpoint like one frequency, he can open things up and kind of expand more frequencies. With, with one control, I have to push more sliders up. So slightly different ways you use them, but you can accomplish basically the same things. Yeah, absolutely. How do you use yours? Uh, I use it different all the time. It's kind of like an SSL EQ. So it's got three bands. Um, and then you can widen or tighten the cue on those three bands. You got low, mid, and high. Um, it's got a low and high filter, as well as a low and high shelf and a boost. Um, what am I doing right now? I'm just boosting some mid range. I just kind of in here felt like I wanted to. Look at us to, mid boosters. Yeah, just a couple of mid boosters. Uh, I just wanted to <laughs> push it a little harder. <laughs> The notes just jump a little bit more, yeah. you know? And then you can hit it with the boost if you want. Yeah, you can. I don't use a ton of overdrive. I mostly will 
I have one, and then I have this one, but I don't care that much about it. But I usually have one, That's and the then... the one I sold them, for the record. <laughs> I usually have one, and then I'll just have two clean boosts, and I'll just drive them all into the amp. And that just kind of works for me. I, I have found, for myself, at least the less pedals I have, the better things sound. The more pedals I add in, the, just the worse it gets. So It'll always sound better playing something the cleanest you can play it. That's like a big studio thing. Like live, it feels cool to have lots of overdrive and saturation and energy, but when you go to record that, saturation can also just be called compression, basically. So again, like you could have a lot of distortion or overdrive saturation going on, but it actually might sound way smaller. Um, it's the old Mutt Lang ACDC trick where you turn your stuff up super loud, but you play soft and let things kind of bloom. Um, you only do that by like playing cleaner. You can't have stuff super, super dirty. Otherwise, it doesn't have that bloom. You, you know, once you're saturating at a certain point, you don't have any more up, you know, space that you can go. Things can only kind of come down. So, yeah, I also yeah. I use my volume lob, knob, my volume lob, my volume knob a lot too with that one overdrive. So I'll have it, you know, maybe around seven, and then if I want to get dirtier, I'll just crank the volume. <laughs> Yeah, dude. And then I I don't really have to deal with compression issues because that will happen for sure. Or you'll hit the amp way too hard and you're like, where'd I go? And your amp's in the back like, <laughs> like just exploding and caving in on itself. You're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Is your volume pedal before or after your overdrives? It's after. Good man. Yeah. You guys know the difference? Yeah? All right. We don't got to get into that then. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Yeah, more I could do this all night. Uh, like music? Music? Ooh. Uh, Morgan yeah, Wallen's new record. It's just a master class in layering guitars. I'm not typically a big pop country guy, but I love that record. Um, there's a, another Nashville band called Twen, T-W-E-N. Their record is... I heard a lot about them. Dude, it's sick. I'm loving that record right now. I have to look at Spotify to see what I listen to because I basically just listen to these Sunday songs a bunch. Um, and Taya's song, because Daddy's been on a bunch of tour stuff lately. Um, can't say that name out loud. Um, I can't do it. Uh, I'm always, like... Um, I love Ryan Adams. I know he's kind of a controversial person now. Um, but, man, his songwriting and his guitar playing is just so cool. So something like that is always on. I like the, you guys ever hear the Jim James record? He's a singer from My Morning Jacket. Um, man, he's got this really cool song called Here in Spirit. That song's been moving me lately. I really like that. Um, and then uh, I've been listening to Either Or from Elliot Smith, if you like depressing songs yeah that record rules um so yeah i mean that's just a little bit it changes every day it's like oh i've got to mow my lawn tomorrow tomorrow so i'm gonna listen to power trip which is like kind of stuff i just want to march around my lawn like you know <laughs> former heart you know i grew up as a little hardcore kid so like i just my musical taste is all over the map but yeah Morgan Wallen and Twin right now are doing it for me. How about you? You probably listen to super cool music. No, right I don't know. I, I kind of listen to the same stuff I always have. Uh, I've listened to this Kurt Vile record a lot called, um, I think it's called Bottle It In. Yeah, Bottle It In by Kurt Vile. I really like that record. Um, we've been listening to a lot of Van Halen in the car. A lot of Van Halen 1 and... What's your favorite Van Halen one riff? And James can you Cried. play it or attempt to play it? Yes. <laughs> That's a, 
was a good choice. Uh, what else? Me and my kids in the car. Yeah, we listen to a lot of music. So we've been listening to Van Halen 1 a lot. We've been listening to Jailbreak by Thin Lizzy. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever, guys ever listened to Thin Lizzy? I like them. What else have I been listening to? I mean, yeah. Uh, I listened to, we listened to a lot of Hendrix last week. I listen, I like kind of always listen to Leonard Skinner and the Stones. Those are kind of probably my two like go-to bands. Um, I just like old rock and roll. There's a new record that actually came out uh, by a guy named Andy Schauf called Norm. That's really, really great. If you guys get the chance, I would listen to that. It's Schauf, S-H-A-U-F, and it's amazing. I really like that record. It's really, really good. Yeah. I can't think of anything else. Yeah, I, I I'd normally throw back before I listen to new music, but every time I'm asked that question, I feel like I have to list new artists because nobody wants to hear like Fleetwood Mac or... Deep Purple for like the millionth time, you know? It's hard to pass over Sticky Fingers. Every time I see it, I'm like, I'll just listen to this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long time. I, I did that I did is, love The Chariot. Um, that's mine. Those guys were gnarly. The early Norma Jean stuff was like the era, era I was into, all the... Um, You you know you know you're like a you know early two thousands hard hardcore kid if you know this riff. All that stuff, and actually, well, actually here to tie here because I, I feel like I got to tie this back in with church music, right? Um, you get you get all the the crazy dissident stuff in hardcore music, like right that 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 half step rub interval. Yeah. angry and aggressive and pissed off but like if you just turn off the overdrive and like play a chord under it um it's um jen song come to me it's just hardcore It's just hardcore music, but played clean. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Oh, man, I grew up around all that stuff. Uh, I was just a uh, uh, Mercy Me's guitar tech, um, Backline Ben, we called him. Um, he he threw out this riff from a song I hadn't heard in forever from a band called May. Do you remember that band? Dude, I was like, bro, take me back to being 13 again. What the heck, man? So, yeah, I, I have a soft spot for all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, let's do. Let's do Austin's one. Like on one more better question, music. Um, and then we'll we'll call it. Or actually, let's do two more. Yeah. Anybody got one? Oh, dude. I mean, <laughs> yeah. The best the best guitar I've ever played. Um, and Shane can tell. Um, I I went to Carter Vintage Guitars. Nashville is a difficult place to live as a guitar player because it's guitar mecca. There's a million amazing guitars, none of which I can afford. Um, and so I, I showed up to do this uh, video with my buddy Scotty Mills for um, some friends at Walrus Audio. And the cool thing about doing a video at Carter's is you walk in and, like, we have all these incredible vintage guitars. Like, you'd have to sell a kidney and a home to buy. Do you want to play one? Whichever one you want. Uh, and so they, they brought out a 1958 uh, Gibson ES-335. If you know anything about vintage guitars, that's the first year that the 335 was made. Um, and this particular one had an unbound neck. So if you, if you see a 58 335 and it doesn't have the binding on the neck, that's how you know it's an early 58. So one of the, one of the you know, closer to one of the first ones made than, than not. You know, if you see the binding, that's... Too. What's that? They have a different neck angle, too. Oh, do they? Mm -hmm. Good to know. Expert here. This Carter hat. You, you got all the insider information that's on that all, stuff. But that's all I know. <laughs> anyway, they brought that guitar out, and it changed my life. And I think about it often, and it has since sold. And I don't know when in my life I will ever have, what are the, I mean, at the time that guitar was 30 grand. And that was before 
inflation the lately, so down. it's probably like 45 now. 40, 45? I have and that no wasn't idea. even like a clean one. Yeah, I'm it, out of the game gu now. Old guitars are very expensive. So that guitar truly blew my mind. Um, and then my favorite amp that I can also not afford um, is a specific variant of, of Marshall they made in 68 and 69. It's a 100 watt super bass with the, uh, there's a, a particular one that has a large transformer. They call it the lay down transformer. I think it's a, is it a hay bower? Is that the, the brand? I don't remember the brand name. Um, but yeah, 68, 69 Marshall super bass with a lay down transformer. That with that 335, I would sell my soul for, for that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Taking donations at the table in the back, so. Yeah. Mine would also probably be that guitar. Um, that was a really crazy guitar. I used to work at that shop that he's talking about that he did that demo at. And so, yeah, it was a 58 335 with gold hardware. And someone tried to act like it wasn't original. But the thing that's interesting about Gibson is that they had what they called Monday and Friday Gibsons. So, you know, you come in from the weekend and maybe a little hungover, <laughs> and so you'd end up with some interesting guitars on Mondays, and then on Fridays, everyone just wanted to go home, so they would just, like, throw a guitar together, um, so you'll end up with these kind of anomalies, but anyways, that was a really excellent guitar. I mean, I guess, I don't know, I'm trying to think if there's any other guitar that, like, electric or acoustic or both. Well, it's funny because I don't even own a Gibson, and that's the one that I'm like, man. It's like we were we were talking earlier. Uh, we we've both owned multiple Gibsons, but for whatever reason, we always end up selling them. I love them. So yeah, yeah, I love them. It's a love hate. I sell them for whatever reason. Uh, and then I guess yeah, that's probably the only guitar I can really think of that like super blew my mind. And then for amp, I mean, I love like a mid '60s Vibrolux. Which is kind of similar to like what a ProSonic is, you know, it's a black face fender with two tens. It just wouldn't have a mid knob or any of the like gain stuff in it, yeah. you know. It'd just be straight up volume, bass, treble, tremolo, and reverb, um, or vibrato on the fender, but it's actually tremolo. Uh, probably that. I mean, acoustic. We had this nineteen uh, forties J forty five with maple back and sides. Gibson was like trying out different woods in the 40s and stuff. Normally a J45 would have mahogany. Uh, an advanced jumbo would have rosewood. This J45 had maple and it was the best sounding acoustic guitar. <laughs> I hate talking in absolutes, wow. but it was the best sounding acoustic guitar I've ever played. It blew my mind. I have a good Carter story about you. Okay. Do you remember the time uh, you were working there and I walked in and we were, I don't think I bought anything from you that day. Um, but, you know, a place like that, like, there's so many guitars everywhere, you never know what's hiding. Um, and so Shane mm. goes, hey, man, um, while you're here, you should, you should look over in that corner and open that brown case. And anytime you see an old brown case, you should get really nervous. Um, so I'm like, surely not. Because it was just like leaning up against this, like uh, the, um, the, the counter, right? Like, it, it, it didn't look like what was going to be in there just based on how the case was sitting. And so I set the case on the ground and I opened it and sure enough there's a 59 Sunburst Les Paul inside. So somebody ruined the neck painting red. But then I think Dan Auerbach bought that guitar like later in that week. Mm. I vaguely remember that. Yeah. You told me to open a brown case and I was like, this is going to hurt, and then I opened it, and <laughs> it hurt very bad. <laughs> I was like, I have no business touching this guitar, but I'm really glad Shane told me to. <laughs> One time I went in the back, and I found a, an old tweed case, and I was like, what is this? There was like a back uh, shelf where they would put stuff on for storage, or like if someone bought a guitar or put a down payment or had it on hold, and uh, I'm like a Fender fanatic, so I saw an old tweed case, and I was like, no one's back here. I'm going to check this out. And I opened it, and it was, uh, it had belonged to Ed King, who was one of the guitar players for Leonard Skinner. He's the guy who wrote the riff for Sweet Home Alabama. Um, and it was a 50s real Mary Kay Strat. I don't know if you guys know much about those, but blonde body, maple neck, gold hardware. They made, like, 
I think, don't quote me on this, but I think less than 100 of them, and he had one. And I don't remember what it sold for, but it was in the hundreds. And I, I don't even think I grabbed it. I think I just looked at it in the case and was like, I'm going to put That's this not back. a guitar you want to pick <laughs> up, and then, you know, Walter comes around the corner. He's no. like, hey, what are you doing? But just to have <laughs> it in front of me, it was just like unbelievable. I've only seen one behind glass. I've never, like, been able to, like, touch it. That's yeah, pretty cool, man. I think I gave it a little touch. A little tickle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one more question, Austin, or have we <laughs> gabbed too long for one you guys? More? Uno mas. I got one right here. Yeah. Um, how do you guys manage on worship stage the the line between I don't want to be distracting, but I also want to use the gifts and the talents that God has given me and the experience that I've been able to acquire over many years. How do you find that line of not being distracting, but also playing cool riffs and having fun? Um, I think it's just... Um, uh, not every guitar player might be wired this way uh but i am not the guy that like wants to be flashy naturally i enjoyed soloing and and you know stepping out that's fun um but for me what's much more rewarding uh is uh contributing to the song as a whole right and 10 times out of 10 it's not the the flashy, distracting thing. Um, almost every time, it's just going to be like serving the song and 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 playing that. And, and also too, it's like um, you know the the same way I wouldn't walk into a, a bar and just like get like beers thrown at me and probably like some sandwiches and just like stuff you know and so in the same way like I wouldn't show up to the bar and play that like I'm I'm probably not going to show up on a Sunday morning <laughs> That's for the church down the road yeah <laughs> Sign me up. I want to go to that church. No, not you guys. Um, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's 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 not really. It's it's a little bit of a non. Next county over. Yeah. It's. I feel like that is um, sometimes a little bit of a, a non-issue. Like if you're if your heart is to serve the song, to serve the team, um, oftentimes, be, I think we're a lot more aware of our gifts than other people are. Like in this class, we're all musicians, guitar players. You, you, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about an overdrive pedal or an EQ or a voicing or something. Like, the people sitting in this building on Sunday morning are unaware of that. They have no idea what delay pedal you're using, what... All they know is they're either hearing the song that they like or um, if they notice something, it's either because you messed up. <laughs> usually when people notice something, it, it, it's, um, it's usually because something wrong happened. If that makes sense, do you guys know what I mean? Like, 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 if you're messing up, that's normally when people take notice and they're like, "Oh, like that's distracting." Otherwise, it's like, "Oh, like here we are, like Lion and Lamb, great, yeah, I love this song, cool, like worship Jesus." Like that's that's what people are engaged in doing. And so, if I'm doing my job, which is to to create that, like, I don't really have to worry about being distracting necessarily. Um, I can I can play the flashy riff in that song and people just interpret that as oh that's just how the song goes you know so i think that's just mostly being tasteful as a musician and like seeking to serve the song yeah yeah i think if your goal is to serve the song you'll be fine you won't really have to worry about it i think another thing too that i didn't get a chance to say but wanted to is you know when you're playing with another guitar player like if i'm playing with pope my goal is to make him sound awesome yeah, and vice you know? versa so I'm always looking to see what he's doing because anything that I want to do, I don't want to step on him. Um, I don't want to step on anybody, so, but especially him or the singer, you know. Um, but we've covered the singer. They're fine. 
Uh, no, but that is a big thing, not stepping on the vocal. But when working with another guitar player, you know, that really should be your goal, is making that person sound great. And sometimes that looks like just chilling out and, you know, trying to fill out what they're doing. Um, yeah. And follow-up question. As a songwriter, is it a good idea to be writing more complex guitar parts so that there are opportunities for people who have more skill to share that in a context that people understand? Or are for the corporate worship, is it better to have easier guitar riffs so that people of really any skill level can work with it? I think probably easier. I mean, yeah. I was always raised in, the guy who taught me how to play would always tell me less is more. And I really think that that is something that can apply to so many areas of life, but especially with music, you know, I think generally simpler is better, you know what I mean? Like if you listen to pop music or anything like that, it's always like the lyrics, the parts, the melody, you're like, why didn't I think of that? It's so easy, you know what I mean? I would probably err on the side of simple, especially like, I think in general, it's a good rule. Um, I think you have an opportunity to move people more if you're worried, if you're not worried about playing something complex, but more worried about taste and playing something that's musical. Um, but if you're writing that's songs- That's the word right there, musical. Yeah, musical. If, if you're writing songs for the corporate body, then I would err on the simple side, you know? I don't wanna do some crazy thing that's gonna be hard to play, but if you're working on a record like Tides, where you have an opportunity to make a worship record and be incredibly creative with it, which I yeah. think you absolutely should be, and I think that's something that the church is really missing in worship music right now. It's kind of like become like the fast food version of what was once fine dining. Um, so, you know, you're always kind of trying to weigh those two things. If you're writing a song that other people are gonna play on Sundays, yeah, I'd probably go simple, but if you have the opportunity to do like what they did with Tides, then by all means, do it. You should do it. Yeah, and I think too, like the cool thing about music is like it's completely subjective to the listener and also the person writing it. So if you have something that's in your heart to to write, whether that's lyric, melody, or you know instrumentation, like don't be afraid to get that out. Maybe like Sunday morning in the middle of you know a certain song is not the time for that. Um, but if you have something in your heart, like find a way to get it out. Um, and equally too, like you know, a, a complex part versus a very simple part. Um, complex parts can be great, I think, personally. Um, but anytime I'm hearing something like that, I'm always asking myself, why? Um, is it serving a purpose in the song? Is it is it benefiting what's happening musically? Is it taking the song and the lyric and the mel melody, the lyric, yeah, the lyric, the melody, and the song, is it taking those things, is it elevating that and making all of that better, or is it distracting and taking away from that? And I think if it's elevating it and making it better um, and, and blending, then you're totally fine to do a more complicated part, I think. You know, I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I would definitely, side more on simple for corporate worship. Um, but I mean, heck, like I'm the guy pegged with the lion and lamb riff, right? And it's turned into the fail video guitar guy thing. And <laughs> it's it, it's funny and it's great, but also I'm like, well, you know, that that's also like an opportunity for people to learn and to, to grow. So you can, you can see it both ways. And I think too, um, I, I, kind of forced myself a long time ago to get over the idea of like being embarrassed about like messing up in church you know um this is not like <laughs> this isn't like the arena down the road like a u2 show or something like this is this is expression to the lord um and we're all doing it together and none of us are perfect so um i think don't be afraid to go for stuff but ask yourself why you're going for it and make sure it's because you're serving the song and serving what's there um not just like being complicated for the sake of being complicated. Yeah, I think there's context to it. I think you made a really good point. I think there's a place for, yeah, do both. Why not, you know? But I think if you're able to kind of read the room and know the context of the situation that you're in, then you'll know if it works or not, you know? But 
Sure, why not? I had a joke on a lot of the Bethel records that most records I played on at some point, I would write a part that I couldn't play and I had to practice to get better at it. Um, and early on, I'd be like, oh, I'll just write something different. But then it was actually Greeley that was like, no, actually, you should you should play that because um, that's serving the song. So like I, I had somebody kind of helping teach me the difference. And then like I, I remember um, we did um, the the synesthesia record, which was like instrumental versions of our corporate worship songs. And there was one tour where uh, Amanda wanted to do, uh, it's like obviously if you're paying to see Amanda Cook, you ha she has to sing You Make Me Brave. Well, she's tired of the banana -na version that we played a million times. She's like, hey, can we do the synesthesia version? And I'm like, oh my God, that's got a really tricky <laughs> part in it. And so I had to, had to sit there and just learn it, but it was actually really, yeah, like, can I sit down just for this part? Um, but it's cool. Like, I, I practice it, and um, I don't know. It's I'll just play it really fast. It's it's kind of cool and maybe a little more complicated. But sure. um, it's a, it's in a big you know um, crash section. So uh, takes plenty of time in the, the records and stuff. And it And so, like, I mean, that's a pretty complicated part for, I would say, most church people. I don't know. I've played guitar for 30 years now, and I struggle to play that sometimes. <laughs> I was sitting here like, I haven't done this in a couple of years now. I hope I do it right right now. <laughs> um, but I, that, 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 for me, was a learning lesson in that very thing of like, oh, like, there is a place for this. It's just you got to find the right place for it. You know, it's got to serve a purpose. Chris made me play that in the studio, and I messed up over and over and over while Chris is just sitting there like, hey, man, yeah, w you got to redo that. <laughs> and I'm just, like, every time my soul's just a little more crushed. <laughs> you know it's bad when you're doing a session and you get to the point where they don't even say anything in between takes. You just hear a click, and then the song starts again. <laughs> like, hey, man, do you need anything? Stop. Uh, no, we're good. <laughs> you just hear the pre-roll again. You're like, oh, I guess I'm doing it again. <laughs> Y'all, on that note, let's give it up for Michael and Shane. Come on, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you guys for being here. If Thanks you have any more us. questions for him, we're probably going to hang out for a second. Yeah. Put some stuff come away, hang so out. Come come play our awesome guitars anymore. if you want. Well, come play any of my guitars. You can speak for your own guitars. Play my guitars. Um, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you can have them. <laughs> <laughs> Fire sale. It's a broken amp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's selling that Telecaster for forty-five thousand dollars because he's trying to buy that three thirty-five. That's but, right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Cool. Um, thanks, guys, for being here. This is Thank super you. fun. Yeah. So, yeah, come come up and hang. <laughs>